Inside the Birds is back. Hello, everyone. Good night. Welcome to Inside the Birds pregame live presented by DraftKings here at the Goose Island Brew House in Fishtown. I'm your host, Jeff Mosher. Joining me, my Inside the Bird co-host, Adam Kaplan. Back with us, as always, former Eagles Pro Bowl left tackle, Trey Thomas. Yes. And a special guest tonight. He was so good Still the first there. time. We had to bring him back. Sans the sunglasses. He's just yeah, showing you know. everybody what he really looks like now. <laughs> Former Eagle center, Jamal Jackson. Welcome back to the show, Jamal. Appreciate it, man. I know you're uh, very excited to get in on this. Oh, uh, well, you know, under different circumstances, yeah, but. Oh, know, no. The, the circumstances <laughs> are exactly why you're here tonight. We have a, a lot to get into. If you're watching the show, please give us a share on whatever platform you're watching. And on YouTube, please give us a like. That goes a long way for us. We'd really appreciate it. If you are a YouTube watcher, just hit that like button. Uh, there's a lot of changes that are going on with this team. A lot of things that we need to get into before we even start breaking down Eagle Seahawks. We have to take a, a bird's eye view of what's going on with the Philadelphia yes. Eagles right now. Trey, I want to start with you because you said something last week in uh, your show with Derek Gunn, Girl uh -huh. the Birds, which you can see on the Inside the Birds platform. Mm -hmm. uh, you said something to Derek about questioning whether the team's problems are actually fixable at this point. Uh -huh. You said, is it too late to fix it? And so I want to kind of revisit that with you right now. How are you feeling? I mean, we know the team is 3-6-1. and one. We know what the schedule looks like, so I understand what you're getting at. But uh, we've seen this team rally in December. But are you past the point of thinking that the problems of this team can be fixed this year? Yeah, no, yeah, I think it's too past. I think it's past. I think the precedent has been set with this team. I think that, you know, it's not the young guys that are causing the problem. It's your vets that are some of the issues with this team. I think that um, you, you have too many guys that have been taking advantage of, of Doug's uh, way of how he is with some of the players and not having a ruling with the iron fist. So to me, I just feel that, you know what, you, this team is what it is now, and you're just going to have to ride this out. I mean, it just is what it is. You might find some guys, because if, if you can fix it, it's going to have to come from your vets. The coaches can't fix this at this point. Mm -hmm. This is it. I mean, the, the co why can't the coaches fix it? Well, right the now? time for them to co fix it would have been during training camp. I mm -hmm. mean, during, then during, uh, for, yeah, it should have started in training camp. Right. You should have set the precedent in training camp. But then if you were going to try to correct the way things were going, the bye week was the time to kind of do some stuff. But when you come in and only have a walkthrough or whatever, a 10, 10, 10, you know, you just pretty much just like, all right, man, we just gonna have to just ride this out and just ride the wave and then deal with however this thing ends. Jamal, you were on teams in 2006 and 2008 as well as Trey that rallied from adverse circumstances. And of course, the last two years, the Eagles were in similar predicament as far as their schedule and what they had to do to make it to the playoffs. Are you on the same vein as Trey here that they've kind of got, the ship has sailed on, on how many comebacks they can make? Well, uh. As far as wins this season, uh, you know, no, I'm not fully on board because they still have games left. And at any given Sunday, anything can happen. I mean, we haven't seen any evidence that to prove otherwise that they're going to go on a run or whatnot. But, you know, I just have to believe that, you know, all the hard work that they did years past, like I'm, call, I'm, I'm speaking to the quarterback, you know, that, that mm -hmm. don't just go out the window. You know, you don't rally a team back you know, with practice squad guys and go and make it to the playoffs and then all of a sudden just fall off the, the, the football planet, so to speak. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's still fight left in them. And to what Trey was talking about, you know, it is hard for the coaches to try and implement something to change this thing around. They should have took a page out of the Dallas Cowboys book and cut some guys. You know, you mm -hmm. got to send a real message. Like nobody is in fear of their jobs mm -hmm. at the Novacare. Nobody. They don't, they, they, they don't, they're not fearful of losing reps, losing the starting position, or even being benched. So, you know, to say that the coaches can, like, kind of, like, turn it around and do it now, you know, you'll have half the locker room thinking, like, okay, why didn't you do that weeks ago? Sure. You know, why now? So, sure. the, you know. There may be one guy tonight who is a little bit fearful about losing reps or having some kind of accountability, and we're going to get into that because that's the starting quarterback based on what we've kind of found out this week. We'll see. Uh, I want to continue to take a kind of a, a broader look at the Eagles and start with kind of looking at the state of the franchise right now because it was a very tumultuous week for this team, even not playing, just with all the reports in the media. I can confirm that Jeffrey Lurie was not at the Cleveland Browns game. Now, 
there's COVID and travel, but there's also the idea that he's very, not, as Adam has been reporting for a while, he's not happy with the product. He's, he's actually on very offense. unhappy yes, with offense. the product on offense. Yeah. And so he was not at that game. And Adam, I also want you to go into okay. what you're hearing about the owner's mindset right now. Tell us what Jeffrey Lurie has been thinking about this. Well, I could just go back to what I was told after the Dallas game that he let some of the offensive coaches know how he felt about their offense, where the state of it was not very good. So you, you fast forward, it has not improved. Now, obviously, the quarterback has struggled. Uh, they're not scoring points. That Dallas game, unbelievably, this is the point of the season. The Cowboys were so bad, the NFL's worst defense, were ranked 32 in just about every important category. That night in Philly on Sunday night, they only scored 15 points. That's probably why it, it all culminated in, in, in the owner saying what he did to those coaches. But at this point, it's almost just like last November when reports were coming out about how the owner was upset. As we know, he wound up firing two coaches. The way he did it is he, he let the people know who had to do it, the general manager and the head coach, that those two coaches had to go, and they went. I'm afraid we're at the same point now, unless he turned it around. I, and, and as Jamal's saying, I, and I agree, I don't know they're going to. Mm -hmm. what, what signs have they given us that they could turn this around? And, and Trey's talking about the day after when the players come back out of the bias, it's on that Monday. It's usually a 10, 10, 10 or very light practice. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get the whole thing turned around then. It, it happens in the classroom. Okay? It happens with instruction. It happens with taking coaching and, and, it, it, and you caring about it. And as Jamal was saying, it's a very good point. I haven't heard a lot of this, but we need to talk about this more in our shows going forward. Players clearly do not fear for their jobs here. Who's getting benched here? No. Jason I mean, Peters is not getting benched. No, it's weird. The guys that you wouldn't think, like Nate Herbig has apparently been benched there you go. in favor of either Matt Pryor or in favor of maybe even Sua Opeta. We'll have to see tonight how the offensive line shapes out. We will get into the offensive line in a minute. But again, as it all seems to circle back, it's certainly coming down on the quarterback. In fact, what I was told is that the owner himself has made the directive to Doug Peterson that if Carson Wentz continues to struggle, you go to Jalen Hurts. And so we've heard reports that Jalen Hurts has taken more, so more practice reps. So that's where came from. Wow. You heard Doug stumble wow. kind of through uh, a press conference. That's it. Yeah. Jeff, that, okay, based on what you just said. Wow. And based on last Wednesday, that explains why Peterson was so unsure of himself on With Wednesday. questioning, right. <laughs> where he, I was one of those people, like, it was one of the situations like he didn't just do that. He didn't just say like, well, Carson Wentz is our starter today on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. in, this in this media market, you think that's going to go over? Which it didn't. This, this is a talk radio point here. I mean, this is our, sh our TV show right here. Right. I, I couldn't believe it. So, so you, what you're hearing, this is the first time I've heard this. You're hearing that Jeffrey Lohr is the one that said, I want this guy to play Jalen Hurts or second round pick. Now, let me add to If Carson there. Wentz continues struggles. to struggle. Je I, am, I know for a fact Jeffrey Lurie was involved in the, the drafting of, of this player. Now. Mm -hmm. Whether he gave the directive, I don't know that, but he, this is a player that he really liked. I know in 2015, Johnny Menzel was drafted by that regime in Cleveland. Why? Because the owner wanted this player. He didn't tell him to do it, mm -hmm. but you don't want to, you don't want to displease the owner. Yeah. So well, that's where we are now. Wow. I, I always wonder, as, as former <laughs> players turn media, Jamal, you're media right now. Yeah, you've been media. You know. Sometimes defense. you don't worry about what the owner is thinking or doing when you play because you just got your own jobs to do. But I've always felt it's dangerous for a franchise when an owner is too heavy-handed and also too distant. But if you have an owner making calls, whether it's the draft, whether it's personnel, I feel like that's when you start to descend into some really murky territory with the future of your franchise. Mm -hmm. Did you guys ever, just when you played, wonder what the owner was thinking or what kind of you know, impact it had on, on the actual X's and O's and, the, and what was going on? I really didn't think about it. I know for myself, I really didn't. I, I you know, I always respected Mr. Lure for who he was and, and, you know, we always joke around when I slap the cookie out of his hand. You yeah. Know. You yeah. slapped the cookie out of Jeffrey Lurie's hand? Yeah, I ended up being released after that as well. So, you know, <laughs> what? Yeah, it's totally a long story. That's but another yeah, inside tip. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but, you know, but, but, but I always had a, a, a really good respect for Mr. Lurie. But, um, you know, I never worried about, you know, if he's out there watching what I'm doing and checking what I'm doing. You know, my whole thing was, look, I need to make sure that Juan is cool with it and Big Red is cool with it, because if they're cool, then I'm going to be all right. So I never really worried about, you know, if Lurie's, Mr. Lurie's out there. I mean, you know what? As an owner of a billion-dollar franchise, 
you should come out there and check on your investment. Mm -hmm. And you know, and that's what you should do as an owner, you know, but I never was really worried about what he thought about what we were doing out there in practice. I mean, we were out there trying to get it and Juan had us had his foot on our throat so much that we couldn't even really worry about it. Trey, but at what level should the owner get involved? You know what, it, it, when you start, when you come out there, and I think as an owner, and this is just with any business, and anybody that's running a business, when you come out there and you see that things aren't being run, ran to the standard that you expect, I mean, you know, anybody with any business should step in and make some type of like, hey, whoa, whoa, I don't like the way this is going. Too many guys are standing around. Guys are not dressed the right way or whatever that is. I mean, you know, at any level, on any business, I think that once you come in as an owner, if you speak in and you see that things aren't being ran to your standard, you should have, you have the authority to step in and say something. Well, and that's certainly, as you talk about the standard, and as Adam mentioned, it was Jeffrey Lurie who presided and enabled over an offensive staff change with Mike Groh being out and then the new offensive staff being in. And clearly, the offense has regressed. I mean, even last year, with all the pitfalls, it was still an offense that finished third in the red zone and fourth on third down. A top five offense in situational football. This year, they are not top five in anything. And obviously, you're seeing what happened. The owner is not very happy about the investments that he made. Where I'll, I'll break from this, this a little bit. Go ahead. I have to correct you there. You they are top me. five in sacks allowed and quarterback hits. Oh, jeez. Oh, yes. oh, negative geez. category. <laughs> <laughs> that's not, that's a lot of a positive stat, right? It's a negative saying. stat, right. You know. um, I, I, I hear what you're saying about being the owner and having the right and being invested to want to see your product better. Uh, I do think in football and in sports it's dangerous, though, if there's too much intervention yeah. and you get yes, to a point that's where my point. you hire the people to do their jobs yes. and if they don't do it at the end of the year you find different people but yeah. in, in the draft in the middle of the year I think we get into a sticky situation yeah, I just right. think the football should be left up to the football people you know I mean I own a trucking company but I don't know how to fix an engine or nothing like that so you know I leave that to the professionals and then you go from there. You said you don't own a trucking I company? I say I own a trucking oh, company. Oh, you own a trucking company. Yes, but I, I, I don't know how to fix actually given the first curse out, so yeah. I wanted you to clarify. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody can still know no, we're a sort of family I, friendly I, I show. I do, Jeff. I do believe that his interest in Jalen Hurts, Jeffrey Lurie's, stems from the team missing Russell Wilson in 2012. I think all but one or two people wanted Russell Wilson in the worst way. The guys yes. who wanted him, the owner, Roseman, Joe ba this is Joe Banner's last draft, by the way. Joe Banner did. If you go down the list of guys who are involved, they wanted him, and that they've never forgotten about that. W and here we are tonight. Would that qualify as making a mistake to cover up for a past mistake, perhaps? But, but no one, it, it's interesting. And Russell Wilson, by the way, was a third round pick. Yes. What did they do? They took Jalen Hurts in the second round because they were afraid if someone would take him the third mm -hmm. or fourth round. Mm -hmm. But what gives you the belief that he could be anywhere close to Russell Wilson? I'm not saying. Hurts can't be a good football player. He might. There mm -hmm. were some teams that liked him. Mm -hmm. But do you really think he's that special? No, I, I think I, it's fair to say yeah. that um, how, they how, would how many years ago so. now? It was almost eight or nine years ago. It was Russell Wilson's size that scared a lot Five, of people. Ten, it exactly. wasn't his yeah. actual right. sure. talent. Sure. He came from a scheme in which he was able to throw the ball a lot. He wasn't always open. It wasn't a spread like you're seeing in the SEC. He played at Wisconsin and played very well there uh, and against some pretty tough defenses. So I agree with you. It's not an apples-to-apples -apples situation. My, my final take before we get in on this is that based on things that Adam has reported throughout the year, things that I have also heard throughout the year, what I really think is dangerous right now is that I don't believe that the franchise pillars are all on the same page. You have an owner becoming more involved. You have a GM who, as Adam just talked about, had a, had a curious draft strategy. You've got a head coach who was not allowed to even preside over his own staff without somebody else making decisions for him about his staff. And that, to me, shows that the guys who are most responsible for helping this organization win they don't appear to be on the same page. And I think when you have that happen, you're close to unraveling. And clearly at three, six, and one, we have to see what happens. This, like this you've, got, you've got the personnel director and the GM, and you've got the head coach and the owner. When the owner wants something done, you kind of you feel like, or if the owner gives a strong opinion, you feel like, because I remember talking to teams about this over the years, you feel like if you don't do what the owner wants, or suggests, or has shown that he would like to have done at some point, you, you start getting concerned about your job. You feel the external and internal pressure. So right. it, they're in a tough way here. And how would you feel if you're Carson Wentz now? You're in practice. We'll get into what we had heard and the reports out there. But 
none of this is good for, for Carson Wentz's psyche. No. Because he's, he knows it's, it's out there. Right. It's been reported ad nauseum about who's taking reps, and Carson would know because he's the one who's a quarterback. None of this could be good. We will get into the idea of what happens if Carson Wentz gets benched because I feel like people don't see the middle to the situation. They're only, you got to stick with him or there's no way you can bench him. Imagine the tone that's going to set for the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. You guys were involved in, in both a, a team that had a different play caller and a different and a quarterback get benched, and we'll get into that. I, I do want to first get into the offensive line because there seems to be breaking news by the, by the hour with it. <laughs> uh, we learned that Lane Johnson a couple of days ago is going to be out for the year. He needs another ankle surgery, as Trey pointed out when we were off air. Didn't they say it was a shoulder that he came out of last game? Yes, yeah. correct. It, and it was it a shoulder and neck injury neck, that, yeah. that, that brought him out of the game, and yeah. then you get past Thanksgiving, and then it's now all of a sudden it's ankle. Yeah, and the yeah. shoulder's no longer on the injury. Yeah, no. Right. Man, neck at and this shoulders. point, who really knows what's going on? Exactly. Right. Now, Doug, I think, uh, coming out of that game against Cleveland, also said that, uh, you know, Jason Peters, he, was, he, he, he came out of the game. He just, you know, he kind of got fine. hurt. One he of the things got was hurt. he kind of got hurt. Right, and now like, we find out from, the, from Adam Schefter that he's playing with a dislocated and broken toe and moving to right guard in the process. That means Jordan Maialata, as we know, is going to start at left tackle. Jason Peters, right guard. Isaac Sayamalu, left guard. Jason Kelsey at center. Mm -hmm. And at right tackle, apparently, will be... Matt Pryor. Correct. Now, how long that combination can play together tonight? We can, well, we can do a pool right now on that one. Nate Herbig is the top backup guard. Right. I don't know. Uh, who, what's it? Uh, Sua Opeta? I he's done. Right. No, he's oh, done. Right. He had Jack he had, Driscoll? Yeah, he's done. Yeah. Jack Driscoll is going to be available tonight to play right tackle or guard. Yeah, Luke Duriga will That's be available. That's the other guy, the backup center. That's it. That's yeah. all they got left. Okay, so how did everything work before we Yeah, before yeah no, I was going to ask you about it. Yeah. How did it go from turf toe? to broken and dislocated toe. Well, he had actually, I'm told, he, he had the turf toe injury early, when he went on into reserve earlier this season. And I was told he didn't have surgery, but the, the, the report from ESPN now, because he has a broken and dislocated toe, he needs surgery. Now, just so you, have you guys had turf toe? I had a doctor show me what it is. It's when you stretch or tear ligaments in your toe. Well, the, it may be that, I'm assuming it's the same toe. Because uh -huh. now it's gotten progressively worse where he's got to need surgery. Can a ligament tear lead to a broken bone, though, or is there I, some type knows? of favoring? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. That's a good question. I'm not sure. But here's the question for Jamal. He played in the interior. Is that true? Like, if you get, obviously, if you're not playing on the wing or mm -hmm. on the outside, it's a different mindset. You're playing inside and almost yeah, like in a foam It book. is, and it depends on what foot, which, which toe it is. Oh, right. How do you step? Right. If it's, his, if it's that right foot where he has to lead, you know, to try to, like, get out in space, or if it's that inside toe. If it's the inside, he should be fine. Because you can kind of guard with everything going inside. I don't know if Trey agrees with that. <laughs> well, that's that's going to that's that's affect your get off. Because he's a right guard. Yeah, so if this is left. Oh, he got a little step down. No, but if he, but, but to me, all right, so if, if, if I know, if I, knowing that JP has to go to right guard and knowing that he's never played right guard, I'm going five down. Oh, yeah. I'm going five down. I'm going to put their ass in space. And I, just so that he can't say get five help, down real, yeah, real I'm quick. saying that I'm going to go five down. Seattle is a 3-4 is a defense. So you're going to have a nose tackle, two defensive ends, and outside linebackers. We call that 5-0. Yeah, that's going to be a 5-0. So what I'm going to do is all five guys you're going to have five guys. guys. You're going to see that from Seattle several times. So you're going to see five defensive linemen down. You might have two guys that's standing up on the outside, and then everybody else on inside will have their hands down. But I'm going to go five down, and I'm going to stretch you out. I'm going to make sure – that you can't send Kelsey to sell Like, it. that defense creates one-on-one -on -one matchups. Yeah, it's going to create one-on-one -on -one matchups. I personally like as a center, because inside, one-on-one, -on -one, that's what you want. Right, but you didn't have a broken toe. Well, yeah, you have a that's broken true. Toe. And now, if he has an inside foot, if his left foot is a problem, then now, if you have a wide three technique, a wide four eye that he has to kick out to, if his left foot is jacked up, how is that going to help when it has to kick, when it has to come to him kicking out in space? Because he's on the right side of the line. He's kicking with his right foot and dragging his left. You can, prote the left. You can protect him. The, the turf toe that you're talking about is the big toe, right? I don't know. It, I'm not sure. The, I just know. I just that he know has. That, yeah. I'm assuming big. it's the big toe because <laughs> okay. Okay. if you break any of the other ones, it you, might you be can, the big piggy. It might be the middle. I'm piggy. assuming whatever toe it is. Whatever toe it's it big is, because it's on it, Jason it, Peters' it, foot. Right, <laughs> the piggy is right to the market. Well, yeah, but if it's on his inside foot, you can protect it as a right guard. That's uh -huh. all I'm saying. Like it won't. It's not as hard to cover up an injury. Uh, what when about you're from, is that from an anchoring standpoint? And, yeah, and what about wide, he, Okay, what about zone running though? When you have to kick out, I mean, is is that? I don't think they'll put him in that situation if they know he's ailing like that. Well, so that means 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 that
We around here clamoring for the quarterback to do sprint outs every damn play. So, all right. I mean, <laughs> if you're going to protect him, why Touché. not protect the lineman? All right. Yeah. This, 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 this to me seems like it could be a problem. And I don't know which foot it is because now, if, even if you go 5-0, all right, if 5-0 works. They'll get works, it from tape, by the way. They'll know. The, the oh, yeah. Seattle, Seattle will know yeah. from the coaching tape. Yeah. They'll know what foot it is. Oh, yeah, they're going to go 5-0. And then if we not, are wasting time talking about a toe from a lineman. Cause we don't really, you we don't injure Man, toes. Okay. But Trey is, did, did Trey, I, I got you. But Trey has said all year long that if he, this guy's going to play inside, he's going to have more collisions, more. You know, the outside you have space, and sometimes a guy doesn't really rush you. The play is the other way. It, isn't he technically going to be involved in almost every single snap from a very physical standpoint? Dude, you're dealing with bigger bodies, and the action comes at you a lot quicker at guard. It does, but you have time because you have more bodies at tackle. We saw what he did last week at tackle. In space. It didn't look it didn't look pretty at all. So I'm thinking at guard, hey, you got a two way go now. You got somebody on the inside and the outside of you at uh-huh. tackle. You had that one guy on the outside, but you know just not long enough. But then, okay, so how does that how, how does that going to hurt them now? Because now if you know that JP is going to be hindering, so now that means that you're going to slide the line to the right. Yeah. So that means Kelsey's going to go right all day. So mm-hmm. what that means is we're going to see what Jordan Mailata got. You're going to see. That's what we're going to see. Oh, that. That's what oh, we're going to see. That's going to be the problem. Oh boy. Oh because boy. If, if JP is injured, they're going to always push Kelsey to the right, uh-huh. and now the left side is going to be man. And if any defensive coordinator has any sense, he would make sure that Kelsey goes right, and then you're going to bring everything to the left. The only person they got to worry about is Dunlap because he's been having like a good. He crushed, and it's funny, yeah. he crushed Peters in the first game. He's, he's been playing pretty good. Seattle so, mentioned that to me. You yeah. know, but yeah. Peters on the inside now. You know, Dunlap uh, plays outside, so yeah, it'll, yeah, be, yeah. it'll be him and my lot of. And this blitzes. is, hey, man, look, like they said. Jamal this, Adams is coming. He's he, coming. He is, off, but right this in the gap. defense, he, like, like the report said, they're about to get about 1,000 yards more than an all-time leading. Yeah, what? the 32nd ranked defense in the like NFL. If you can't complete a 10-yard out on this team, then yeah, we don't need to. We don't talk anymore. Like, well, get rid of everybody. I, <laughs> can I just say I really I, I get a kick out of you guys talking offensive line. And all, this is the second time you've been on the show, and you guys are ready to put the boxing gloves on. Because I'm going to the center, and I love yeah. it. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> you don't understand. Like the center the tackle is always everything. Right. right. So he thinks he's smarter than everybody. But, but he is. But the tackle is always right because they get paid the most. No, no. I'm not always right. <laughs> Hell, I'm all listening the time. to you. All the time. I'm listening for you. And like once you get a call, then I go and do what I do. I mean, I wait for you. <laughs> I'm, I'm producing the reality. When the reality show starts, I'm producing the reality show. It's, it's, it's my fault. No, like physically. No, okay. no, I, I accept hey, responsibility man. for all my <laughs> all right. mess ups. Don't okay. try to do that. <laughs> let's all, time, let's <laughs> also <laughs> note that uh, Matt Pryor, who's getting lost in the sauce here, is somehow starting at right at tackle. Right. We saw how disastrous it was at left tackle, so maybe it can't be as I, bad I, as I right can tell tackle. you this. They do believe that uh, that is his best position at right yeah. tackle. At this point, I would probably agree with them because he, he struggled. It, look, we, we said before the season started, despite what was out there, he did not have a good training camp, and that kind right. of bore, you know, bore out here. Right. But the guy that you told us about was Jack Driscoll, and the question is, because he's not big enough physically yet, he needs to get stronger. But I, I know you said you had said that Stoutland really likes him, correct? Stoutland really likes him. You saw he started the season opener at right tackle um, over at the time. I can't remember who else they had Jordan. an opportunity to. It I was guess Jordan, Jordan Mailata, Mailata right. that was going to be your guy. Right, but yeah. they do like his athleticism. They think, as Adam mentioned, that if he puts on more weight yeah. and is able to keep mm-hmm. that athleticism, he could probably move inside mm-hmm. and play guard. But for right now, they like him at right tackle, which is why I'm um, questioning why he's not starting at right tackle tonight, yeah, but he, he did have... in week one when Lane went down, he did. Right? He's played a couple of times yeah. throughout the did, year. I think he might... Did he start against Pittsburgh? He started against... My might have played left. Washington. Okay. I mean, he started okay. the season opener. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lane wasn't ready. He yeah. did yeah. come back yeah. into the game for Pittsburgh Correct. when Lane had to go out. Correct. Yeah, so he's played, but perhaps he is still uh, not 100% from that injury that he had. It's Speaking of injuries, we will get into the injury report. What's up? There's too many regressions on the line. Like, yeah. you never see... A guy that that does good one week and he keeps that spot. No. You know, it's like there's just musical chairs week in and week out. And then a lot of it has to do with putting older guys back in there. You well, know, instead of letting the young guys. The, play. the first year, Jamal, that you started. And did you play? I mean, you didn't play well every week, did you? No, were, no. Okay, no. so were there weeks you ever feared I might get benched, or what, did it? Did Juan say, "Hey, listen, you're, you're good, just to, well, to, no, well, make, no. How, what, we, what happened man, that rookie year? It was, it was like. Your life depended on, on every snap. That's how Juan coached us. Wow. Like, 
Man, I was at the Novacare more pressure? than coaches at yeah. times. That's that's just how he was. And why worked us, he man? Worked, like, he was I a, mean, a he stickler, right? Yes. Us. And like understand, like even when you talk about young players, when you say, all right, young guys as of waiting, why on Fridays would make sure that the young players that weren't playing in the game, you bring oh, your we, pads we out. We had a practice oh, after yeah. practice. You had the a extra practice special after yeah. 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 Yes. Bring your yes. pads. We're going to get some of these young defensive linemen so that we can get you up to speed because yeah. you never know right. if your number's going to be called. Right. Oh, yeah. I, I remember the famous quote from Nick Cole, a backup center <laughs> who had to start right guard, and he, he had filled in for somebody. I can't oh, yeah. remember what year it is. Oh, yeah. I He's got a pack of reporters around him, and you guys remember Nick said about five words, right? Yeah. Everybody said, well, are you going to be able to start right guard as a full-time starter? And he goes, sure I am. Somebody says, why are you so confident? He says, because I got Juan Castillo, <laughs> that's why. And then the co press conference was over after that. That's all into the show. He was built like a fire hydrant, that guy. Oh, Wasn't he like yeah, five yeah. foot 11 or six feet? And, and yeah. see, that was another testament to Juan. You know, he had guys that were undrafted that would come in and, like, provide some depth and actually fill in. So, right. You, know, you, you just don't see that nowadays. You no, know, the man upstairs is not happy with all of you right now. Yeah. We see lightning bolts coming down, and we hear the thunderclaps. I'm good. Because, I'm uh, my ties. Oh, I'm you put right. your time in? All right, you're yeah, good, I'm good. good. I'm good. All right, let's talk about some of the uh, injured players who are not going to play. The Eagles will not have Zach Ertz tonight. That's yep. official. It looks like he's going to need one more week. Yet again, earlier in the week, he was trending in the right direction. Later in the week, he wasn't ready yet. So. Uh, it's always about the messaging with injuries with this yeah, team. He got hurt actually against Baltimore in week six. Right. So this coming week would be seven. I, I could add a little bit to our reporting. Mm -hmm. Urch is told to expect it to be closer to six than four weeks. So we're right at that. We're right at that number now. So like you said, it should be this week, but it's a high ankle sprain. I you never know. He's the only player that went on this three week IR or short term IR that didn't play well in the IR is actually the IR thingy. they just say you can come back after well, three yeah, weeks but three most, yeah, of, the yeah. high but most of the guys that right well didn't um uh Dallas Goddard didn't he have the same thing he had yeah, he but had he a small fracture he's small fracture yeah, yeah. Okay. Three weeks. Yeah. but yeah he, but did. He, he did yeah. he's like the only one like everyone else once they well, he had, had the, the same he, I was told he had the same high ankle area where Christian McCaffrey had his McCaffrey was out about seven weeks yeah all right, Sua Opeta, as you guys mentioned, will not play uh, for the rest of the year. I believe he's going to have surgery, according to NBC Sports Philadelphia. So he'll be out. Lane Johnson, we said, is out. Jason Peters now at right guard. Nate Herbig, I guess, will be a backup tonight. You talk about regression. Well, he should dress. Jeez, he didn't dress last yeah. week. Yeah, no, this is one guy. He better dress. Yeah. I'm confused about the perceived regression of Nate Herbig because I thought he was holding his own out yeah, there. Yeah, me too. I think it was the injury. Uh huh. I, I really do think that that. The that finger? got him in a doghouse. Yeah, yeah man, you're a lineman. Like, yeah. I mean, I'm not in. I'm not in their meeting rooms or even the training room. But yeah, when know. you're a lineman and you tell them, you he hurt his finger. Makes it tougher to hold. Yeah. 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 Finger, he he makes it tougher but, to commit penalties. Jack, he hurt his finger. I know. That's you know, why. To, you hey. know what? What we have to work on is our sensitivity. Okay. <laughs> and, that's, and that's the problem with us. Rudy, we have, <laughs> we, we have to work on our sensitivity. Man. What was, yeah, what, yeah. By, by the way, Trey, what was the worst injury you played with? Uh, what, plantar fasciitis? I played through back injuries. Like I, I had my um, two. Whenever I had my back surgery, that was on my birthday. I played in oh New York, God. and then I hurt, felt my back hit, bam, and then, then I think I finished that drive, and then came out. Um, plantar fasciitis. I did it out in San Francisco. I felt something did pop you, in my foot. Did you p tear the whole thing? I don't know. For, okay, but uh, all I know is that after I popped my foot, I um, ended up going to New York every Tuesday to have my foot zapped. Never missed a game. Wow. Um, wow. So you had some interesting yeah, yeah, like I, I like deep thigh bruises. Like. I had to sleep with my <laughs> my heel like tied up to my thigh, my my hamstring, because with a deep thigh bruise, you don't want your leg to straighten out. You want to keep it bent. So I had to sleep with my leg bent like that. You know mm. what I'm saying? Like, I, I mean, you know, like, that's why. Hitler like, Ryan had it bad. The that's why I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm, remember, not, I'm yeah, not, you know, I know like, I know. when it comes to injuries, uh, you don't want to hear it. I'm not yeah, the one yeah, for that. Yeah. You know? I can only imagine what Runyon said. I remember when Runyon oh, broke his, his tailbone. Yeah, yeah. Bro yeah. Runyon had to stand up on the cross we country flight. Yeah. Like, it was did bad. He, did he, was yeah. he, he had to stand up on the cross country God. flight yeah, the next yeah, week, like, right? Man, I, I, I used to see Runyon have to get his butt shot up every game and come out there and steal ball, not miss he, a game. He broke it on like what, like a Thursday or Friday yeah. and yeah. played that Sunday. Wasn't didn't he fall in the cold tub? Yeah, the cold tub. Yeah, that really happened. And that's why we have to work on that. Yeah, we got. Yeah, we do. I gotta be honest with you. For this whole time, I thought that that was just like something you guys said. 
He really fell in the cold tub? Yeah. yeah. No one running. I thought he was out there wrestling is. pigs it's, or something. It's real <laughs> slippery. The, the cold tub is like the hot one and the cold one. Like They're like next to each other. So right. you do the contrast. Yeah. Uh -huh. And, you know, it's a little slippery. That size 16, on. it missed. <laughs> it wasn't a dancing bear that yeah, day. No. We've got to work on our sensitivity. Yeah, we'll, but I think we'll get you training. We'll get you guys training after the show. Phil got in the doghouse because of his his finger, which I don't know, did it break or something? Or? Uh, I guess we will. Uh, we'll probably get. We'll find that out after the year. So the line, the, the 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 line is a mess, but you know yeah. we'll get through it tonight. We got Jason Peters at right guard. All right, uh, it just came down. Up. It just came down in the last uh, half hour. Or so Jannard Avery has been active. Uh, I don't know if he'll be on the act. Uh, is he he's activated tonight? for the game? He's activated to the roster. He was on IR. Right. It doesn't mean he's active for yeah, the game. Yeah, because right now with Vinny back, he'll be the fifth D DN. They don't typically dress five DNs. That's correct. So we'll see if he if he gets some run. Uh, Caleb Wilson, the tight end, and T.Y. McGill, the defensive tackle, elevated from the practice squad on the side of the Seahawks. Chris Carson going to play? Yeah, I was told earlier last week that he definitely was back from his midfoot sprain. He missed four games. They definitely need him. Now, Carlos Hyde did a great job against Arizona. He will play tonight with his hamstring injury. So those are the two running backs. Travis Homer, who had filled in, he's, he's out tonight. He's got a thumb, a wrist, and a knee injury. David Moore, their punt returner, who's been like their third receiver, mm -hmm. he was added late in the week with a hip injury. So they'll see how he looks in pregame warm-ups. And they will not have Brandon Shell, who's not really good, by the way. He's below average, the right tackle. Right. Cedric Oboye, the former first-round pick for the Bengals, is also not very that. good. Right. That was good pronunciation right yeah, there. Yeah, I had to look that it up. That was awesome. I would have <laughs> tore that name Yeah, up. I don't know, I, unless I looked it I up. I believe he was one pick later yeah. than Nelson Aguilar that Is year. that right? Yeah. Okay. By the Texans, though. So he will so. start at right tackle tonight, the former Bengals first-round Bengal, pick. Bengal, Bengal, that's what right. it was, yeah. Man, man, the lightning is crazy tonight. All right, here we are. Uh, Evan Pochick, you said, will yeah, play? Posick, yeah, Pochick is back. He's their center. He had a concussion. Now, in the secondary, here are the big ones. Shaq Griffin is back, their, their starting corner. Uh, he missed the past four games. DJ Reed, who had been filling in, uh, he, he didn't practice this week. He's got a foot injury. And Quentin Dunbar, who was one of their starting outside corners, who could also play inside. So they're getting pretty healthy here. Well, he actually got put on IR. Oh, I'm sorry, not him. Past yeah, week, yeah. IR, so right. he is not playing. He's, he's got a knee injury. So. But with Griffin and Pochick back and, and they're Chris getting healthier, right? They're player. getting healthier, but there's an opportunity healthy. here if the Eagles could protect to make some plays downfield because Seattle does give a place. They're good against the run. They're not good against the pass. No, they are not. 32nd in general in defense in the NFL. So as you guys have mentioned, you should be able to move the ball uh, if things are right. And as we mentioned, Vinny Curry, Corey Clement are off the reserve COVID-19 list. Uh, real quick weather update. It's storming now. We see lightning. We hear thunder. And we thought maybe it was something we it said. Looks like, it looks like it's going to stop by 7 o'clock. So. All right. So we should have yes. pretty good game time conditions. Yes. It's throwing weather. Yes. No rain. So uh, we'll see what happens there. Uh, I'm glad that we have Jamal and Trey on tonight because, as I mentioned in the opening of the show, I want to go back a little bit to 2006 and 2008. Those are teams you guys played on. And I think that there's some relevance to what was going on then as you look to now. It's not apples to apples, but there are certain things that happened in both of those seasons that I think are applicable to tonight. Let's talk about the idea because there's a strong sentiment out there that Doug Peterson at this point should be more of a head coach and hand the play calling to somebody else. Now, who that somebody else will be, we, we've talked about. It's not like there's a, a natural sidekick here, but you guys in, in, remember 2006. And let me just remind you, when Andy Reid was the coach, at f they were four and four, right? They were kind of on a two-game stretch there where things weren't going well. And their bye was actually, I think, And they were the going into point. the bye, right. and Andy Reid gave the play calling to Marty Morningway. So I want you guys to kind of go back to that. And you remember what happened a couple of weeks later Donovan McNabb gets hurt out for the year. Mm. Jeff Garcia becomes a quarterback. But a lot was made about how the offense looked different when Marty took over. What do you guys remember? Start with you, Trey. Hey, who's calling the play? I really, you know, like, like, man, like you know, <laughs> Jack. Like, I keep trying to tell him. I, hey, like, I, I don't think uh, about it. Do you like, know I, what plays, like, what plays I didn't called care. differently? I didn't care who it was. Mm -hmm. All I want, what's the play call? Mm -hmm. What is it on? Break the huddle, let's go. I, you know, like, you know, like I didn't, I didn't care who it was. It could be Coy Detmer, it could be AJ Philly, it could be Fire, it could be Jeff Garcia. I don't give a damn. Right. Who is calling the play? Let's go. Like I never was one that really cared about that. 
Let's call the play and let's Cause go. Because you were going so, over the plays anyway in practice, so you knew what it was. It didn't really matter. Yeah, I, I fair I, enough. Like, but you can tell though, just by being out there, when your team is in a rut offensively, and when things all of a sudden. I didn't even think about flow. that. Like, yeah, I, like for real, like yeah, I didn't. Like, like I'm not. I, I didn't think was, about that. It was tunnel vision. Right? Yeah, I was so tunnel like, vision. Like I didn't care. <laughs> okay. Like I didn't know if we were in a rut or if we were doing good. Am I blocking my man? That's all I worried about. I didn't yeah. care. Did he make a sack? No. Nope. All right. Good. Yeah. I'm keep moving. Let's is that, is that the one? I didn't care. Like, tunnel like you. Yes. Only... That's that's all I worried about. Right. I didn't like. Right. You know what? Like I go back and I watch some of these games, mm -hmm. and I watch some of these replays, and I and you know one of the things that you hear the crowd noise, you hear the horn, and all the crowd, because you see some of these old plays that are old clips, and I wish as a player now that I would have taken the time to experience all that. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. now at the time I was just so. Yeah. Tunnel vision. Yeah, just I was just so like, look, I got this guy. Which right, foot does right, he right, have back? Right. Inside foot, outside foot. Is it two jet? Are we Fox two? Is I it mean, a five step, seven I, step? I, what I, are we on? Are we on one? Are we on side camp? Are, are we on three? Hey, Trey, what we got here? Hey, Jack, what do we do? Oh, Lee. Oh, yeah, we did. There it is. That's, Let's that's go. Basically that's all I, like. I want to know. Like, <laughs> that's whatever, all I want to know. Whenever he was asked, I was going to say, I imagine Jamal is the center. Oh, of course. At very least, with the the quarterback behind you, yeah. it was noticeable. What, what do you remember about that? Well, we went more run heavy that year because uh -huh. you know once. Well, Andy Reid did. Well, it's Marty going to plays now. Oh, Marty. Okay. As an offense, we shifted because I remember we we had lost to Tennessee. Correct. Like, that's when we had lost uh, Donovan for the year. He had messed up his knee, and then we had went and played. Uh, I want to say Indy. And Peyton just shredded us. Was know? that the and Sunday night game? Yeah. When Garcia started? Yeah, and yeah. the whole time, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I, I remember, you know, me and Marty, me and Marty, we get into it on the sideline because I'm like, dude, we need to run the ball. Like, because oh, uh -huh. they're like scoring every time they get it. We need to slow them down. I'm like, run the ball, you know. Mm -hmm. Marty comes that? to the sideline. He's like, one. You get your center. You tell him I'm calling the plays here. He just cursed me out. <laughs> yeah. like, wow! But he wow. did it. He wow. ran the ball. After that game, we ran the ball. Well, it's West, interesting. West, we had like 13 million dollars so, that year. So was yeah. it was it the Super Bowl year when they played the Chiefs? Uh -huh. The players' committee went to Doug and said, "Listen, this is ridiculous. This is when they're oh, talking run about ratio. 2017. Yeah, their yeah. pass run ratio was 75, 25 pass. That was bad. And they said you got to slow this thing down, and he did for one game, and then he went back to throwing the football. Right. You know what? The only thing I remember from that game when we played it against the Colts. Is when that was Jeff Garcia's yeah, first yep, game. Yep, that was yeah. it. And Jeff came in there and he was like, "All right, everybody, calm down. Everybody, <laughs> calm down. <laughs> you know what? I need right. to calm down." Yeah, exactly. and that's the only thing I remember about that game. All right, let's go. Uh, and then right. I knew that it was silent count. I got damn the white Freeney out there. Man, I ain't got time to be thinking if we. Oh if man. I got the yeah. white Freeney. Man, would he jump the snap? He yeah. was unbelievable. Well, you know what? Like this. Now, this is what like this. this is what I learned. By the way. The by the way. Yeah. The Colts, what, what, okay, so this, yeah, I did a study see, on the Colts. See? And what the Colts did, they found an offensive lineman that had a hitch. They never looked at the ball. They looked at the offensive lineman that had a ah. hitch. You see what I'm saying? Because every have a hitch? offensive lineman has something you gotta, that gotta he does. You got to get up before you go. Give, you, tell, know, yeah. tell. you look at Kelsey, he leans back before he snaps tell, the ball. Tell. Sure. Yeah. Every, you look at an offensive tackle, sometimes yeah. he flexes his ankle. Sometimes they do something. Those little yeah. nuances. Yeah. <laughs> you look at the coach, they never looked at the ball. They look for a hitch. And that's Freeney what never looked? other teams do uh, that. Freeney never looked. No, just look at you, the, no, your no. Feet? They look for whoever has the hitch. Okay, it's okay. Amazing, that's man. what you go off. You go off the hitch because the hitch will never lie. Uh -huh, it could yeah. be wow. on three. It could be on four. Wow. That hitch is just what you do. Right. So wow. there you go. That so, was, you never know what you're going to learn. I know that's pretty good stuff. Man. So one thing that's really interesting about that year, that when Andy decided to give up the play calling at four and four, and Marty took over. The Eagles had the second most passing yards in the league at that point. They had the sixth most points in the league. And they led the NFL in total yards. Wow. So Andy had the, the, the foresight, I guess, to say, we could still be better. I need to give this up to Marty, get a fresher perspective. Now, we found out last week, we had an uh, interview with Joe Banner on ITB TV, and Joe said that Andy actually gave up play calling several times mm -hmm. during his career just to keep things fresh. I, I, I was shocked. I was shocked. I mean, Which was shocking. Did you know that? When, when no, we, we don't, don't have Trey. Right. <laughs> no, no, but you, I mean, you were the center. Right. Yeah, I'm the center, but like we didn't know. Like, hell, he he made. But you knew to go to Marty. You knew to go to Marty. He made right. everything seem right. like the same. Like Big okay. Red did right. never. He right. never really changed. Because like, all we're gonna hear is what five calls. Yeah. Okay. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like all we hear is, hey man, this is 95, 96. If it's gonna be two jet, 36 crack pass, 67. Yeah, and but I I, I, I knew I knew Marty was calling all those damn passing plays in Indy. <laughs> He let me have it. So. <laughs> so, so do you think when you look at the, the way the team is now, the offensive struggling that's going on, Doug even said in a press conference 
coming out of the Cleveland game. Everybody talks about the head coach and the quarterback in this city, but we're missing tackles. We're, not, we're missing blocks. We've got this going on. We got that. He started to blame every other thing going on. And I'm, in my head, I'm like, well, that seems like a really good clue to start addressing the team as a head coach and not just a play caller. Be more yeah. of a CEO, well, right? Like Tom yeah. Coughlin, who didn't call plays, he would go around and check each area. In fact, I remember Andy one year. Now, this is obviously, was, it was awful. This is when Jim Washburn and Juan Castillo were having problems. And they were coming out of the lockout, and Andy was not happy with the issues with Washburn and, and Juan Castillo, because Juan, remember, went to the defense. Mm -hmm. And I would, this is when we were allowed to go to practice. I would watch Andy spend time on other areas, and he was not calling plays. Right. So sometimes as a head coach, you've got to do that. Mm -hmm. Do you think Doug should probably think about this at this point? Uh, think about it. I mean, he's, he's already came out and said, that play calling is what he likes to do. He yeah, enjoys doing yeah, that. Which is a weird like, cop out. I like but to do it. <laughs> if, but if you look at it in the big picture, like he's kind of like got his hands tied behind his back. So he's really playing the role that he thinks he's in. He's not a, uh, uh, it's not a dictatorship. He's not calling all his shots. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're firing his right. buddies. Jim Schwartz is in charge you of know? the defense. Right. Yeah. So he doesn't have a final say over who's who, who gets to play, who he's going to bench, who he's not going to bench. Like, right. If, if, if that's his role, then he's playing it how I see he should. Just so call, it, call your play. It's kind of like, you ever see Office Space, the movie Office Space? Yeah. When they, when they interview everybody for a job, and at the end they say, well, what is it you say you do here? Yeah, right. And the guy really couldn't get If you take play calling away from Doug, and he does nothing. And he it says how much he loves it, right? You, you've heard him say that many times. But that's my problem. I think he tied his own hands behind his own back because you don't put someone in that position as an offensive coordinator. Mm -hmm. So who can you say, all right, you know what, you take over this role for me because things aren't, I, I need to check this team. Right. Because right now it's two sides of the coin. You, as, as a head coach, you can't go, well, he, he dare not go over to Jim Schwartz over to his side of the ball and say, hey man, you know what, I need you guys. I need guys to be doing this and that. And therein lies the problem. <laughs> yeah, that's the not coordinator was hired before the head coach. Like, if you can't, if, if, if I'm running this team and this is my team, I should be able to hire who I want to hire if mm -hmm. all the blame is going to be, is going to be, you know, thrown my way when things don't go right. Right. You know? So you can't just blame Doug in totality. <laughs> that was fair. Uh, two years later, 2008, this has been come up a lot lately. Andy Reid decides to bench Donovan McNabb at halftime of a game that they're losing 10-7 to the Baltimore Ravens in Baltimore. It got to be 22-7 at one point. Cobb then leads the offense down to the one-yard line of Baltimore. He's got a chance to throw a touchdown there and make it a one-possession game. Everybody remembers what happened. He gets picked off by Ed Reed. It's returned 100 yards. And then Donovan reclaims the starting spot on Thursday night against the Arizona Cardinals, throws three touchdowns, and then six, seven weeks later, you guys are in the NFC Championship game. I look at this and I say, if Carson is going to get benched tonight, I think people feel like this is just – the end of the Carson no, Wentz era, I, I and it doesn't have to all. be that way. No, right? no I, I've, I've said on our show, Jeff, that I think he needs to take a step back, just like Andy said with Donovan. Now, the difference was, well, actually, they're very similar. Kevin Cobb was taking an 07 as a second-round pick. Jalen Hurts, 13 years later, as a second-round pick. Yeah, at least Kevin had two years of the offense right. under his but belt. Right, Don, but Donovan obviously is, was, let me see, he was drafted in two, 99. Mm -hmm. And he's first, yeah, 99. So things year. obviously have like, changed since what, like then. Nine, ten yeah. years or yeah. something. Right. Like yeah. Stuff. Yeah. Do, do so. you guys agree with the, uh, and Andy at the time talked about, hey, Donovan just needed a step back. It ju you, sometimes you take a step back, you get a wider view, you exhale. If that were to happen to Carson, him getting pulled, if he gets pulled tonight because they're playing poorly, couldn't that be a positive in the long run to kind of help him clear his head? He must feel like the, everything's against him right now. I don't think so. I no. think that with Carson, if you pull him, when you put him back in, you don't think he's going to try to press a little harder? Well, wouldn't that have been the same philosophy for Donovan, who then mm. came out and four days later? Three five, three thought, five always was cool. I, you know, I, I think five was always cool. I don't think he ever really worried about Kevin Carr really coming in and taking his job. Maybe it helped them kind of refocus a little bit. But with Carson just coming out of a – he just had somebody deal with a quarterback – controversy and what a couple years ago in 2007 he just watched his backup quarterback win a Super Bowl and win the Super Bowl MVP mm -hmm. made him rush back from injury in 2018 come back three games in and got his ass destroyed within five or six games and ended up playing with a broken back for another 
three, four games, mm -hmm. you know, just because he doesn't want to give up that role and watch his backup quarterback again take them far through throughout the playoffs. You think that Carson really wants to deal with another quarterback controversy? To me, I think that if you bench Carson and you try to put him back in, you're going to have someone that's going to be pressing even harder to make a play just because and, of the situation. And you have the, the other issue in this town, and we know this was with Nick Foles and it's so many. I can, we can go back to Jaws and Randall Cunningham. If the backup does well, you know what it's going to be like here. The pressure is oh, even yeah. more not to play the starter, yeah. not to go back to Carson. That's just that, that, that's the risk you run with the owner getting involved here, okay. which should not happen, but well, it's a, happened. A, another thing I found staggering is looking back at the situation. You know, Don, when Donovan was benched, right, the team was 5-4-1. and one. They had a winning record. His completion percentage, 59%, touchdowns to interceptions, 14 to 8. Not great, but certainly not the worst that you've ever seen. His passer rating was 84.7. The team was sixth in points per game and fourth in passing yards per game. So you look at that, he was benched when the team was doing fairly well, as opposed to now, 3 6 and 1. Carson's 14 touchdowns and 14 interceptions. His passer rating is 73.3. And as an offense, the team ranks 24th in scoring points and 28th in passing. So this team is way worse than the offense when Donovan got benched. So it kind of builds, a, you may not think it has a good impact on Carson Wentz, but what about the offense as a whole? A that spark. right now leads a life preserver. The spark, you hear coaches talk about, hey, we just need a spark. That's why you do it. You're still trying to win. Look what, look what Brian Flores did with Tua. This is where it's for, yeah. it's their first yeah. round pick. He yeah. put him in. He put yeah. Ryan Fitzpatrick because they're trying to win a game. Yeah. Not sure that was a great thing, by the way. But right. okay. But, but he got he got not he got sacked. He six was times getting that game. He got much. crushed yeah, by Denver. So I just think it would give them a spark. But in this this media market, you better be sure that you, you this is thought out. That you know what you're doing because you could set this kid back, Carson. Because look, he knows what's happened in practice. Uh huh. He knows about who's getting reps and who's not. So. I don't know if this is the greatest idea, but I do, I do think they need to do something to jumpstart this offense. Well, I think that also shows like, the difference between how the coaches held their offense to a certain standard. You know, when you say Big Red, like, hey, look, we, I know that we are top 10 doing this and that. Yeah, that ain't good enough. We're going to bench right. you still. Right. Mm -hmm. right. But when you, you wait until things are at the bottom of the beat and then now you want to make a switch, uh, it doesn't have the same carryover. Mm. When you can when you can make a call like that, when you're still successful and doing good, that sends a totally different message compared to when you wait till you are almost at the bottom of the barrel. And, to and that's make a what change. Doug has said. He feels that benching Carson for for a long term would send a, or not starting him tonight would have sent a bad message. Do you agree, Jamal? Uh, not starting. I mean, he's been sending bad messages all year with his press <laughs> conferences. Like nobody knows what to expect. You know, he, what to believe? So that think about this. If he says thinking about benching would be a bad message, if you actually did it, we're actually thinking about it. But then he then he has this crazy thing he said last Wednesday, where he completely contradicted what he yeah. said. You yeah. as a player, if you hear that, now did you ever pay attention to what Andy said in press conferences? Well, not really, because we was always told not to listen to the media. Yeah, okay. Like, turn okay. off the radio. Hey. Right. Yeah, I mean, right. that, that's, that's just what that's the message was. I mean, red. there no. was a minute where we didn't even talk to the media. Like, the starters, like, yeah. we, we take off our lockers, go talk to the young Yeah, because, I mean. Cause you it hated it, talking it, to the media. You were all right with it. It, it can get you, you in trouble. You love it now. You know? oh, wow. I'm cool now. Nah, I mean, but now. Nah, <laughs> but see, we didn't really understand the, I guess, the politics of football back then. Now that now that I do, I had to protect my mindset. By the way, I was too wild to talk to everybody. When you guys played, I remember offensive line are seen, not heard. Not heard. Yeah. Yeah. You got a lot of offensive linemen they in the media talk. as they players right now. Yeah, they, yeah, they're talk. talking a whole lot now. They're gearing up for that second Let me career. tell you about all my injuries. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> exactly. Uh, all right, um, real quick, because someone mentioned, you know, what do you do to throw a life preserver or get this offense going? Mm -hmm. That's what they really need. Doug Peterson did say earlier this week, and I'm, we're going to hold him to this one on the truth, is that he's got to simplify. He's going to try to simplify the game plan tonight. He talked about it. He was asked about it. We have the video, so I want to play it for our for our viewers. This is Doug Peterson talking about a more simplified offense. I think it's, you know, to the, to the everyday fan, I think it, it'll look similar. I think some of it's just internally um, with, with schemes and, you know, maybe, you know, not bringing as much new stuff to the table or formations and shifts and motions. You know, I don't think it's been um, drastic one way or the other. I think, it, you know, sometimes that just allows us to play fast. And when you got, you know, moving pieces and a lot of young guys, um, sometimes that can help um, kind of spark 
um, us, you know, kind of turning this thing around. So I don't think it's going to be anything drastic that, that people will really notice, but internally within the schemes and stuff, I think there'll be some subtleties that'll help us uh, play faster. All right, that was Eagles head coach Doug Peterson on simplifying the offense. What does that mean to you when you hear a coach say he's got to simplify the offense? I mean, what, I mean, what, what else can you do? Yeah. How much, I mean, I mean, at the end of the day, it's inside zone, outside zone, damn, five step, seven step, three step drop. I mean, what else can you do? I mean, you know, what else can you he said, do? He said simplify. Simplify it. It, it don't look complex at all. It doesn't look like complex to me. Like what we've been seeing, like, I don't. Like, what you going to do? I don't see any. Let's follow him in your playbook. Play ingenuity. I don't yeah. see the constant right. motions right. in the different They don't do a lot. Personnel. Yes. We've actually been so, calling for that. Yes, I, yes, I, I'd, yes, I'd like to see that. Now I have no confidence that you're going to see you anything do like that. You're going to do a fake two-jet. Yeah, 67, 95, hey, solid. Man. I mean, you know, Doug is. Hey, like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do that's going to make this more complicated than what it is? And then it is football, yeah, but, man. But what I mean, it is is, right, when, when a quarterback struggles like Carson Wentz, you're just trying to short, give short. Yeah, just give him stuff that you know he could handle in terms of passing the football. But see, here's my right? thing. Okay. Get it out of his hands quickly. But, and I agree with that because I think he needs to model his game now a little bit. Like Alex Smith does. I mean, he takes. Oh, he's what Captain Checkdown. Oh, he's Captain Checkdown. Like, I yeah. mean, yeah. So but yeah, because you, you have to crawl before you right. run. You, you have know, to get him. I mean, to, yeah, you're I get throwing that. it to these younger guys down the field, and are fighting for you. You know, of uh-huh. course, the ball is sometimes inaccurate. Sometimes they have to make a play, and you know, more of t- more more times than not, they're not coming up with these plays for the guys. So. You know, why not just take what the, the, what the defense gives you so many times? We had Bill Pauling on, play. what, about a week ago? Yeah, two, uh, two we, weeks ago. Two, two weeks ago, Bill Pauling, the Hall of Fame general manager, and he said, when you're struggling, do less, not more. And he also, we, we asked him about Carson. He did say, shorten it up, get it out of the quarterback's hands quickly, get him confident. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing. When you watch Carson, do you see him playing with confidence? I, I, I don't no. see it. I don't see it. No, but for you to get the ball out of his hands, quickly that means that your receivers need to win quickly so that means that you That's need to scheme them open yes. and if you're not scheming them open then what the hell are we doing right. and, and that? is like, that not is not the antithetical to simple offense like yeah, you got to I mean, scheme you them have open. to scheme the receivers routes, right? open don't say hey we're going to simplify the thing but you don't do anything to scheme the guys open for you for him to get the hand the ball out of his hands quicker the receivers need to win and if you just send them out there and just be like, hey, man, just go out there and go beat man protection or go out there and just beat zone by yourself and you're not running any rub routes or anything that's going to get these guys open, what the hell do you expect? Yeah, but to his credit, the quarterback has been aggressive. Like, he hasn't been oh, taking yeah, the check downs. He hasn't been taking a wide open guy. Instead of going for the home run guy, instead of hitting the guy coming across the middle who's wide open. It's yeah. a bunch of times where we've seen that. Yeah. But you, like, know what? you don't have to have a 21 point play every time. But that's the problem with me though, when I go back to coaching and practice, you know how it is in practice. It's always they about, they, they gonna they give, give you, you that, that first they read. Give you that. that home run read is always in practice. Yeah. And you feel like, you know what, I can go there because in practice it was there. So now it's game time. That read, that, oh, damn, the read ain't there. What do I, I do now? I, I'm, I'm glad and that's the that. problem. But in practice, you also don't get sacked five to seven times. I right. know, because so, they're going to blow, they gonna like, blow the whistle. Hey, like, but they never, but, but that fir- the first two reads in practice every time, it's always there for the, pra- for the quarterback. And you never in times have the, 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 co- the offensive coordinator say, you know what? I want to take his first two reads away. Make him see the field. I, I Make him see the field. You've said that several times, and I can't tell you that it really popped into my head last night watching the game between the Packers. I knew that game was over before it started yeah. when the sideline reporter said that Matt Nagy said Mitchell Trubisky had his best practice of the right. week. And I had you sitting on my shoulder yeah. and <laughs> telling me I'm about loading yeah, up they on designed the Green Bay it Packers that way. Now. Yeah. Exactly, they designed it that way. All right, speaking of Carson, we're going to hear from him and our friends at Sky Motor Cars right now. Hi, this is quarterback Carson Wentz. I'm here to tell you about my friends at Sky Motor Cars. Sky Motor Cars is the premier luxury car dealership in the greater Philadelphia area that promises to provide honest and efficient service whether you're buying, selling, or trading in your car. Go visit skymotorcars.com to learn more. When you buy or sell your next vehicle with Sky, tell them Carson sent you.
All right, great to hear from our friends at Sky Motor Cars. Adam, I know you're uh, oh, yeah. very fond of that place. R really love this guy. It's Brett Shoulder and his group in Westchester, PA, right off 202. The best customer service I've ever had in buying cars now, 32, 33 years, the best by far. All right, if you go and tell them Adam and Jeff sent you. Time to get into some trench talk. Now, we I'm already got. I know, I know Jeff. You know Jeff? Yeah. You know yeah. Brett, too? Yeah. Right, Brett, Brett Shoulders. Yeah, I know him. Everybody. All right. Ah, it's great. Look at that. Brett, 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 a little extra yeah, shout out for Brett. He's in the contacts. You know? yeah, 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 there you go. <laughs> uh, let's get into the offensive line talk. We already kind of preemptively got into it, but I do want to discuss it a little bit because we didn't really discuss now. We, we went individually through certain guys, but you brought up the idea of 5 0, the Seahawks really forcing, forcing the issue here. I have to think that that's also something that the Eagles offensive coaches are thinking about as well. Is, is Kelsey tonight, go, who, who will be starting his 100th straight game, does he protect Jason Peters? Do, yes. you, do you feel like that's the side that he's going yes, to Yes, they're going to go to JP. All right. JP, this, this is the first time that he's going to play right guard, yeah. and he has a janky toe. You don't think that they're going to – listen, too many times when you look at what this offensive line is doing, they slide to protect players instead of the quarterback at times. And that's what I see when you're looking at protection. And I'm just, you know, and this is just going off of what I see. You know, now, Jack may be able to tell you something different, but to me, they abandon the rules of protection way too many times. If I know that the passing strength is to the left and it's a slide protection, which way should we slide? Man, we're going the opposite way, man. We're going to slide left, though. No, 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 no. Uh -oh. If the passing strength is to the left and the nickel is down? No, no, no. You got to understand, the quarterback looks to the strength. We protect away from it in pass protection. So you're telling me that if the nickel is down and the safety is capped? No, nah, if the nickel's down, then we got to change the protection. So then we're going to slide to the left? No, we're going to make a base call. That's what we're going to do. So we're not going to slide to him? No, nah, we're not going to slide to him. Oh, my gosh, See, Jack. This, this is the difference I between it. being a center and a tackle. Okay. Yeah. You listen to me. I'll tell you what to do. Okay? Talk to me, then. Listen, right. I'm listening. So. Whatever the protection is, two jet, three jet. So That's, if it's two those jet, are slide, those are slide. Protection. Explain what slide. Yes, is. so two jet is a three to four man slide, depending on the front. Mm -hmm. You know, to the left. To the left. Yeah. So back is going to be to the right. Yeah, back. So that back means to the passing right. strength is to the it's left. It's to the right. Passing strength is to the left. The quarterback always looks to the passing strength. Passing strength is to the left on two jet. Okay, well, regardless of what he's talking about, we protect weak. That's what uh -huh. the line do. The four down line, man. We got this person, this person. In the I'm wheel. A little offended Can right I stop now. I just want to let you know that I I'm just offended make sure. yeah. that you came on this show and just called me out like this. I, I am offended. Plays, we go offended. Uh, on running plays, we go front side. I am getting old. That's I how, understand. That's how it works. So, so I forget things, but you guys did play together, yeah. correct? Yeah. On some pretty oh, good I offensive lines, right? And, and, <laughs> and, 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 and what, did, what did he say earlier? Hey, man, what's the call? He only, I just do what yeah. call it. Right. I just do what the call is. Right. When you say two jet select. protection. Okay, so two jet. Give us two, two jet protection. Okay, so what two exactly jet. does that right. mean for the layman it's, out there? Like all, all right, so two jet <laughs> protection is a three to four man slide to the left. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. All right. The passing strength is to the right because that's what a quarterback is looking. But the We're protecting is, his blind So the running side. back is going to be to the right? Yes. Why? This is too yet, man. The running back protects to the right. We go to the left. I know. But the passing strength is to the left, which is going to be most receivers. See, 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 you hit a cookie You're out of Jeffrey about, Lurie's hand. See, he's talking about so his judgment can't as be far trusted. as where the receivers are. Yeah, that's I'm what I'm talking, talking about. about protection wise. Because uh -huh. we're trying to protect the quarterback. Yes. We got to protect his blind side, regardless of passing strength or not passing strength. The running back goes to the play side, we're going to the back side. Okay. Yes. End the discussion. So, so that means that the receivers, when I'm talking passing strip, that's talking about where the receivers are. I'm talking are. protection. He's okay, talking but receivers. Yeah, okay. yeah, but that's but that, that 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 takes into the protection. So if we're saying that the passing strength is to to me for me, when I look at it, when I say two jet, I say, all right, running back is to the right. right. All right. So that means that the, the receivers are going to be to the left. So that means nine times out of ten, we're going to have a tight end to the right and then another receiver off there to the right. You know what I'm saying? Just because it is what it is. But your passing strength, the two receivers and are to the left. On defense, who sets the strength for the defense? Is it the receivers or the tight end? It's going to be the receivers. For me. All right, see. Because that's where the nickel is going to be. Let's just move on. Let's just move on. But I'm just saying, that's where the nickel is going to be, Let's right? Let's just move on. So, so but I'm like, just saying, like, I'm, I'm, but, yeah, but for real, I, that's I my serious what question. What you're though. saying as far as the receivers as the passing strength, but for the protection, we protect the blind side of the Yeah, the blind side of the quarterback. Side, and the back goes to the strong side. Yes. 
Okay. And the quarterback looks to the strong side. He'll look to the back side because we got him covered back there. That's right. Okay. That's why I say the strength is to the side that the back goes to because that's where the quarterback is looking. Mm. All I can deduce from this <laughs> is that the conversations like this, if they're that, what's going on in the Eagles class, and now I know why Carson's been sacked 300 times this no, year. But that's just this, simple, this is good that, conversation, that's though. That's just it simple is good. protection. You have different rules for men and different rules for... Yeah. You'll hear on the mics on, on NFL Films, you'll hear 2 jet, 2 jet, 2 jet. Yeah, because 2 jet is slot protection. It's, it's right. Basic right. protection. Four guys, yeah. four man. Because right. what yeah, they're four looking for. Slide. And then, okay, so what are you looking for then? When you go to slide protection, what's going to make you say, all right, we're going to slide to the left? No, that's just automatic. Two jets. No, not necessarily, because you're looking for the, the cap safety, though. If I got a shade to my right, I'm bringing everybody. Louis. That's the right guard, so means, the center, okay. so then the you, left guard, that means and that you bring, Louis is a four-man slide. So we got the shade. To the left? Because it's L. Yeah. It's going to be a Louis okay. four-man you slide. You'll yeah. have the shade, the three technique, the end, okay. and the wheel outside. Well, when you do yeah. two jet right. You That's three jet. It's three, three jet. Oh, three jet is yeah. right. So it then just you switches. Switch it. We go yeah. to the right. So then it switches. Like a Roger. Three jet. Roger. So for okay. me, Roger. I've always yeah, I looked at it. So I was so asking as which side the receivers are. the line call has names. You got Roger. Louis, Rocket, Lee. Rocket. Lee is Lee, going to be Lee, a three-man three three slide. God, they must have said that a thousand a, times in practice. Lee is a three-man slide. Fan is a yeah. two-man okay. slide. Lee, 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 Lee. Roger right. is a four-man right. slide. You know, right. if we go so, Rocket, Rocket, Laser, now I know. That's it's going to be a five-man slide. As a lineman, they they try to make it sound complicated, but if you listen to the words, it'll tell you everything. Yeah, I was just going to ask, the defense know where you're sliding it's based on the whether the, it begins with an L or an R, like if it's Louie or, or, or Rocky, but, you but said it. But also it there's L's and R's in the running game as well. Yeah, uh, okay. so yeah, there's a different right. call for everything. Yeah, it's, so, I got you. It's kind of yeah. hard to pick up if you're going through like the arsenal of plays. Right. Like if you're just looking at it and you don't, you know, you just be like, what the hell are you talking about? Sure. But when you're talking about Lee, Lee's a three-man slide, Louie's a four-man slide, Laser's a five-man slide, mm -hmm. Fan is just going to be a two-man slide. That can go either way. You know what I'm saying? Sure. So then Ray is a three-man slide to the right, Roger's yeah. a four-man so slide to Make right. it simple. Yeah, but, yeah, you but know then what I'm you saying? get technical when you got things like sponge. So you got to bring everybody inside. So then you know, that's both sides yeah. step down. So it's, it, it can get real tricky with like the calls. Well, on, not no. to change the subject too yeah, much. Man, but. Strength is to the left. All right, I'm man. Saying, you won, man. Pass the strength to the left. I'm just saying, you got yo, it, man. Come on, Let's talk show. about a lane. Show me up like this in front of all my people. <laughs> He's right. <laughs> the passing strength is to the left, but the offensive line, we protect the weak side. Yeah, we would take the weak side. Let's talk Which about to the passing let, Let's talk about Lane real quick. Even though he's out, he's gonna have this ankle so, surgery yeah, for the second it's, time. It, yeah, wait, wait, it's wait, wait, unfortunate. Wait, 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 wait. It's based on a surgery that he had over the summer, Jeff. And unfortunately, he's gonna be out months, not weeks. But he'll be ready by the spring. And it, it's um, does he come back the same? Is the big question. I mean, I don't know whether it's I mean, a second, I, it, it's second a, surgery on the same ankle. It's a. I know. It's a look. He 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 had that that tightrope surgery just so he could come back early in the right. season. I do believe he came back a little bit too early. He wanted to be there for his teammates. Remember Tua had this. Jalen Hurts had this at Alabama. Now a lot of college players were having this so they come back during the season. But the tight rope, right? Yeah, this is this is a little bit of a tough one. Did you guys ever have ankle surgeries, either of you? I had bone spur surgery like after my third or fourth year. Oh, but nothing that had to be redone again, right, after nah, that? I mean, okay. You know what I'm saying? I'm cut from a different cloth, though. I hear what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. I hear what you're saying. Uh, I want to get into a little bit too about, uh, well, first I want to say, if you're enjoying this show and, and uh, with this presentation, I don't know how you can't be. This is great stuff right here going back and forth. In fact, I probably lost control of the show a few times already, but that's all right. If you're enjoying today's show, the bright lights, the fancy graphics, and uh, of course the quality sound, it's all thanks to the team at Rebel Hill Productions. Reach out to Zach and Jim at Rebel Hill today for a free consultation to discuss your digital strategy and content needs at info at rebelhillconsulting.com. That's right, that's their email address, info at rebelhillconsulting.com, or you can call them at 215-668-8498. Again, Zach and Jim do a bang-up job. We thank them uh, for all the work that they put in throughout the week. I want to go talk about Jason Kelsey. I mentioned that he's starting his 100th straight game. He is uh, entering the Century Club here for, for starts, despite the fact that he had that elbow injury against the Browns. Now, the Eagles have had a ton of injuries on the offensive line this year. We know it. And th the narrative seemingly after every game was, thank God it's not Jason Kelsey, because as we know, as Jamal knows, yeah. when you lose your center, yes. that really is when everything breaks down. So when he left the game, and he, and he refused to go into the medical tent. 
That was pretty much a symbol of the 2020 season for the Eagles right there. Him just, I will not get into that medical tent yeah, because that yeah. means I'm not coming back out. What was your thought, Jamal, as a center, seeing him walk off the field? I said, guys normally end up on IR when they go in the tent. <laughs> like, so don't go in there. But, I mean, he's been gutting it out, of what, for 12 years, 11 years now? So, yeah. I mean, I, I kind of figured he would probably get it braced up and give it a go. It wasn't his snap hand, so I knew he would. He would continue to play. Well, that's what I was wondering because it's still an elbow injury and right. you still need both hands to block. So even though, because they showed him that he couldn't adjust his uh, his chin strap too well. I mean, if you look at how, if you look at Kelsey's game, uh -huh. he's not he's not big on striking guys. Because mm -hmm. like, right. he's not he's not as not big, big to yeah. wrestle with them. So his, his, his blocking style is more positioning and getting to his spot. Mm -hmm. You know, and then... You know, of course, I mean, he, he does pretty well on double teams, but for the most part, he's an out in space kind of guy. So, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't see why it would hinder him too much unless they get into the situation what Trey was talking about earlier where it's 5-0 and now you got one-on-one. -on -one, now you have to use both hands. So, right. You know, that'll Seattle, only be the problem. Yeah, Seattle's got a couple of meaty guys up front. You know, John, John Reed. Reed guys, oh, yeah. Then Tuna Ford is like, <laughs> he might be 5'11", but his arms are someone of Trey's size. Uh-huh. They, they are no joke inside, man. They're, they're hard to run against, but look, Seattle, as we said, they grip the most production receivers in the National Football League. If you protect, we say this every week, if you can protect, the plays are there downfield. All right, well, earlier this week, uh, well, actually it was last week, since this is Monday night, Jason Kelsey was asked about starting 100 straight games as an Eagles center, and he had some pretty interesting things to say. So let's listen to Eagles center Jason Kelsey on starting his 100 straight game tonight. Um. You know, I don't know that it means, you know, much. I don't know. I don't think that a number means much. I mean, I think it's, you know, you just try and be um, available and, and do your job. And I've been fortunate to be able to do that, you know. I think, um, obviously, injury rates in this league are pretty substantial. And, um, you know, I've been pretty lucky, all things considered, to not have injuries over those course of the 100 games that would sit me down. But... Um, you know, I think that, uh, so, you know, a lot of it's just, you know, uh, you know, pretty good fortune and, um, you know, I've, you know, I'm happy that I've been able to do it. All right. That was Eagle center Jason Kelsey on starting 100 straight games. Now, if memory serves me correct, could be wrong, but Jamal Jackson as an Eagle center started over 60 games. I want to say consecutively straight in your career yeah. yes straight six over 60 straight games. You like to say straight in the hood <laughs> my bad my bad I'm straight straight games not consecutively that's that highbrow language we don't need to use all that <laughs> consecutive right um yeah. as a as a guy who yourself overcame some injuries earlier in your career you had the biceps injury I believe right. or triceps or biceps triceps triceps injury yes. uh Jason Kelsey same thing. same thing he had some injuries early in his career when you see that he's going to start his 100th straight game tonight, and you just meant he's not the biggest guy in the world, right. what, what, what comes to your mind? And that's what's remarkable about it, because he's not the biggest guy in the world, and he holds his home very well. Like mm -hmm. He's a constant all-pro, if not pro bowler, every year. Um, he's been an Iron Man inside ever since you know, they, he tore his knee up. I want to say that was in 2012. Mm -hmm. he hasn't, I don't think he missed a start since. So, you know, And he's in there battling week in and week out, being undersized and... Uh, I mean, you got to give the guy a hell of a lot of credit, man. Right. I mean, he's he's really uh, carved out a great career. It is the most, well, I'll ask you. I mean, I, I feel like people will tell you that's the most physically grueling position because you're in the middle. You have the whole mental work that we've all talked about tonight. You're helping out. Now, I get it. Helping out is not one-on-one -on -one all the time. But, again, he's not the biggest guy. I mean, that's Trey, a game so. you take off as a center. Is it? You I know, don't think you could. I, I wasn't sure. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think center is an extremely grueling position just because, I mean, everything that you have to know out there. I mean, you know, Jack was in meetings that I didn't have to worry about, you know, because, I mean, you were meeting with quarterbacks and yeah. offensive coordinators. I'm like, look, I'm at, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm done for today. Jack, I'll see you later on. Yeah. Just because he has to have that blitz meeting because they need to talk about safety rotations and all of that other stuff that, as a player, I don't have to worry about. But as a center, that's something that's that's front and center on your lobe when it comes to, all right, you know what, this is how we're going to direct what's happening out there on the field. Sure, Adam, I mean, you certainly remember a time uh, early, I guess late in Chip's career, Chip Kelly as head coach, and then the first year, Doug Peterson, who has in general, like Andy, 
tended to like the big mauling offensive lineman where Certain we were size. wondering yeah. if he was going to actually fit into this offensive scheme. And here we are all these years later. Yeah, you, you know, it's funny. When Kelsey was drafted, remember, he had lost a bunch of weight before the draft. Mm -hmm. um, you, you really wondered when he first came here, because it, it was your last, yeah. last year here, they're drafting an undersized guy at center. Okay, I don't know. He's a pretty good athlete. We'll see. But when you're, when you're a late-round pick, man, you get, or an undrafted free agent, you, you've got a lot against you. But, man, I guess – tell that story again. So Howard, Howard Mudd was the coach, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, did he, what did he say? How did he handle that training camp? Um, I have a great story about that, yeah, but I'll let you go ahead yeah. first. Late grade hard one. <laughs> um, well, I mean, from the start, like, actually, I went and met with Big Red, you know, and he was like, man, I, this guy, he just likes faster guys, faster, smaller guys. I was like, all right, cool. You know, so that pretty, pretty much was the end of it as mm. far as talking about what was going on. But when I talked to uh, Howard, it was more or less, you know, I just wanted to help you out with the young guys, um, just try to get these guys up to speed, just, you know, how to be a, just a professional, so to speak. He didn't want my services at all. So, no. mm -hmm. you know, it was cool. I, kinda, it, I, I understood it. You know, yeah. my coach had, our, had turned into a defensive coordinator, <laughs> which, you know, was, would spell the end of me because he liked the hard, hardworking guys that, you know, pretty much didn't have a shot. So, right. you know, it, was, it, it, it was okay. So, so here's what I remember about that whole time period. I remember showing up to Lehigh one day as a beat reporter, and you get used to seeing certain people running on certain teams. And, you know, Jason Kelsey was a sixth-round pick, we knew that he kind of fit the Howard Mudd criteria of being lighter and athletic, but no one thought a six-round pick was just going to get, bam, right. you know, shot out right into the starting lineup. And one day I get to Lehigh, and I notice that Jason Kelsey is running with the first team. Uh, starting And a couple of different new offensive linemen there, too, but that one really stuck out to me because he was a six-round pick and center being as important of a position as it is. And I tweeted that day. I think Twitter had just come out I was a few years say, wow. yeah. Yeah. Right after my space. Day. Yeah. That this is interesting, Jason <laughs> Kelsey getting some first, getting some fill in as the first string center. Mm -hmm. And Jamal must have checked his Twitter account that day because he texted me and said, No, man, he's not getting he's like some he's fill in reps. He he's the starter. The right. And I almost dropped my stuff. I said, yeah. start, and Jamal had started over 60 straight games at that point. They, I remember, yeah, they had came to my locker when we came back from Lehigh. And I was getting interviewed, and one of the reporters was like, uh, so how's the, uh, the center competition going? I was like, there's none. He's the center. Like, yeah. did they, did, I'm, did, I'm not going to sit they, here. Did they enough. sit you down and say this is what's going to happen? How did no. Um, actually, me and Coach Reed, we talked. Okay. And he had just basically, that's all he said. This, this coach, he likes smaller, faster mm -hmm. guys. Wow. Mm -hmm. And that was the end of it. For the most part, because they drafted Danny Watkins that year. They did draft Danny. That was a disaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was that was awesome. Danny could have been good, man. Anybody? If, if he had won, I think Danny could have yeah, been all right. Yeah, if he had somebody yeah. that could. Like, Howard Mudd couldn't walk. Like, yeah, Howard Mudd was he, aggressive he was, as a coach. He was more like. He would destroy your coach. confidence. Yeah. Like, he, you know, he wasn't a nurturing type coach. And it was. Like, we, we came from the tree, whereas one, he wasn't an offensive lineman, so he learned everything all the nuances of how to be an offensive lineman and coach right. the position one was so, a linebacker if i'm not mistaken yeah. Yeah. so yeah. we did it step by step by yeah. step technique right. posture all that yeah. whereas harold Bow was like man give me the best athletes go block him and i don't care how you do it yeah i don't so know if you guys remember how it was. but you know you you were right about danny watkins not you know being a disaster he didn't even start right guard they claimed an offensive lineman off waivers a week before the start of the season he wound up starting right guard. His name is or was Adam Kaplan? Come um, on, you know it. Kyle Devan. Kyle Devan. Kyle Devan. Yeah. Starts right guard a week after being played. In the, yep. the call. But see, yeah, it was a lot of those things that Steve Ballos. That 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 you know, God rest his soul. That Howard yeah. Yeah, did. Like you know, yeah. like he would put guys like Kyle Devan in. You know, yeah. I mean, they could play, but. They shouldn't be starting. Yeah. Like you know, Kyle, Kyle was a, he, he was a, he was a backup in Indy, right. you know, yeah. and he was familiar with, with Mud. He knew the so, scheme, yeah. Yeah. so we're just gonna go ahead and put him on. Yeah. Howard Mud liked the smaller guys. He liked the smaller offensive line, and and, and to me, and, and I don't want to get off topic, but to me, I I've seen Danny Watkins because when I came in and I coached with the offensive line, he was still there, and I felt like you saw him at times where it's wrong? like, wow, this could be nice. Yeah. 
but he needed someone that could really teach him. And Howard Mudd wasn't that type of dude, man. It's like yeah. either you can do it oh, yeah. or he going to talk real greasy to you. And, like, it, it, you know, mm -hmm. everybody can't handle he, that. He and Danny Watkins wasn't the type of guy to handle it. that. He'll tell you how to do it, and then you go yeah. out and do it. And if you don't do it right, it just go to the next person. Yeah, yeah. he, he would, like, he would right, talk well. to you real rough. <laughs> and I don't think Danny Watkins was the yeah, type of person that can handle ball, that. Right. Nah. To circle it back to Jason Kelsey, I remember yeah. a lot I'm of sorry. report. No, that's okay. It's a perfect segue to people asking Jason Kelsey how he was able to to manage to start as a six round pick, but that the first round pick couldn't. And Jason, in a very professional way as he is, was basically trying to say some people adjust to coaching differently and, and you know better than others. So clearly that was that was a big part well, of it. And also he looked there. just like Jeff Saturday. Yeah, he looked like Jeff Saturday. Yeah, so it was man. like, that was his, you remind man, me of someone. That was, <laughs> it, that uh, was his ace in the hole the, the, the whole time. time. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> beard and everything. Oh, you look like right. Jeff Saturday. You're good. <laughs> All, right. All right. We're going to move on. Be sure to check out uh, our friends at PHL Sports Nation, Philadelphia Sports Nation, for all of your latest Philadelphia sports news covering the Eagles, Phillies, Flyers, Sixers, and the Philadelphia Union. Their goal is to enhance the fan experience with their coverage there for the band, fan by the fan. So check them out on social media at PHL Sports Nation and also on their website, phlsportsnation.com. It is time for our Manscaped Man right. of the Game segment. I know Trey Thomas is raring to go with this. Fired up, huh? Yeah, you guys I'm had ready, some interesting man. selections <laughs> this week. And I'm, I'm going to start because I completely stole a page from the Trey Thomas playbook on the, my Manscaped Man of the Game. I went offensive line. Oh, well, look at All that. All of it, right? You got Look at that. Yeah, you got Jason Peters playing right guard. You got Mile out of back at left tackle. You got Matt Pryor at right tackle. And we're, everybody's expecting Carson Wentz to magically snap out of it with this offensive line. I mean, thank God for Kelsey and Sayamalu playing their natural positions. But if this offensive line is not good tonight against this Seattle defense that's not very good, then I don't think it matters who's playing quarterback. It's not going to be a very functional offense. So my Manscaped man of the game tonight is going to be the offensive line. Adam, who's your Manscaped man of the game? Oh, it's got to be. You know what? I, I actually put something. Who did I put down? <laughs> Carson Wentz. Yeah. I, I still, one of these days, Miles Sanders is going to have this monster game. You go, oh, my God, this guy's special. But it's got to be Wentz because the opportunity is there. That's why I put him on there. The weather, it stopped raining, okay, folks? It stopped raining. It's a beautiful night, low 60s. Throwing weather. The, not windy. <laughs> this is the night. This is it. Against Seattle, it's got to be the night. All right. Carson Wentz for you, offensive line for me. Jamal Jackson, you're a center. Yeah. Who do you think is your manscaped man of the game? I'm going to piggyback off Adam. You know, I think it's I'm fair. I'm going to go with the quarterback, man. Like, if you can't pass for 240 yards, which is the least amount of passing yards this team has given up, with his left hand against these people, then yeah, I mean it, it sets up but for can him. Can you to protect? Even if you can't protect, take what they give you. Okay. You know everything underneath is always open against a team that's so vulnerable against the pass. Right. Like, they don't cover everything for a reason. Right. You know. So, I mean, I know they're getting some guys back as yeah. far as like secondary, but I mean, still those guys played in the beginning of the year also. So it was given up. 300 yards to Cam Newton. Car so. Car Carson doesn't live in a cave, and I know that even when you guys avoid media, sometimes it's unavoidable in this yeah. city. So sure. he's had to, he knows what's going on. Do you, you, you feel like tonight maybe he plays a little bit like unencumbered by everything that's gone on just because he's kind of seeing the writing here? Man, I, I, I just hope that he plays, you know, how, how, how he feels comfortable playing, you know? Don't hold anything back because, I mean, you already know what's being said about you in the media and even inside the building, some players and even your head coach. So, you know, I mean, just go out there and do you. Right. That, that would be my advice to him. All right. Well, Trey, I took the liberty of taking the offensive line, which is normally your Manscaped man of the game. So I enabled you to go ahead and make a different selection. Yeah, I'm going Doug Peterson. Ooh. Again, you know, um, I, I, I chose Doug Peterson, I think, a week ago. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going with him again. I mean, because now you have a team that is lost. You know, and they're trying to find their way, and they're looking for direction, and that's something that needs to come from the head coach. You know, you keep having teams that saying, hey, you, you keep coming out every week talking about how aggressive your practice is, but then they come out and lay a dug when it's game time. So, you know, what is Doug going to do to change up the rhythm to get these guys ready to play? Because, I mean, this is a must-win game for this team. All right. Well, you said you picked him last week. They, they didn't win. So yeah. I don't know if you're jinxing him or just I don't adding know. more urgency. I got to keep going with him. All right. Tell us about Manscaped, Trey. All right. Jingle balls to the walls, <laughs> fellas. Listen up. 
untrimmed pubes are a thing of the past. It's time to gear up and get yourself the gift of shaving this holiday season. I'm talking about the Manscaped Perfect Package 3.0. This revolutionary company, Manscaped, has redesigned the electric trimmer. Their lawnmower 3.0 has proprietary advanced skin set technology, so this trimmer will not cut your nuts. It's also waterproof, so you can use it in the shower. The lawnmower 3.0 comes inside their brand new Perfect Package 3.0, which makes for the perfect gift this holiday. It's literally the everything you need to keep, keep trimmed, cut free, and smelling nice down there. And don't use the same trim on your face as you're using on your balls. That's just nasty. The Manscaped Perfect Package 3.0 also includes the Crop Preserver, an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer. You already put deodorant on your armpits. Why are you not putting deodorant on the smelliest part of your body? And yes, your balls do stink. Speaking of sweaty and stinky balls, I am thankful for their Crop Reviver. This product, along with the Crop Preserver, keep your balls from sweating, smelling, and also sticking. And these products smell good. Their mainly scent will help set the mood, if you know what I mean. The perfect package will also come with a pair of Manscaped boxers that'll keep your junk feeling fresh all day. It's time to upgrade those overused pair of boxers to Manscaped high-performance anti-chafing boxers. Tis the season to manscape to get yourself, your dad, your brother, and friends the best gift of all. The Manscaped the Perfect Package 3.0. Get 20% off plus free shipping when you use promo code TRAY, T-R-A, at manscaped.com. Your balls will thank you. You know, my kids were watching. That's awesome. I blame you for that. <laughs> Do you have a boy? I don't. Okay. Ooh, well, so they're really no going to have Manscaped to show them up on that. But made for a woman. I don't think it is. I is think it? so. I think so. I mean, you know what I'm saying? They have gentle errors as well. I mean, huh. you'll be all right. All right. Good to know. Not that I need to think about that right now. Let's just keep moving. All, all right. right. That sounds a little weird. Yeah, right? man. Let's keep it moving, Came man. Off a little weird. Yeah, all right. Let's keep moving. All right. So, so while Doug Peterson's got to worry about fixing Carson Wentz tonight, uh, Jim Schwartz and his defense have to worry about the quarterback on the other side of the field. Russell Wilson is 5-0. and oh lifetime against the Philadelphia Eagles. That includes the 17 to nine playoff win last year at the link. But just in case, you know how Eagles fans tend to think this guy kills us, this guy kills, he kills everybody. In fact, he is 13 and two career against the NFC East, 15 and three if you count the postseason. This just in, Russell Wilson's pretty good. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. matter who he plays, he's pretty good. But to, be, to look closer into what he's done against the Eagles, I mentioned the four and zero regular season record a 98.9 career passer rating against the Eagles uh, in four games. 59% completion, which is not, not as high as normally, so they've been able to disrupt them a little bit. Eight touchdowns to one interception, and he averages four yards a rush against the Eagles. He has, at times, single-handedly broken this team's back. It's those, and on that, it's those second reaction plays when he gets flushed, he moves, he runs, you can't mimic that in practice. I know mm -hmm. that you might have that scout team quarterback like Hurts, but mm -hmm. this one, this guy has just broken your back. You set up really, really well, man. It's just yeah. I mean, you just can't defend. How do you defend that? I know, if I were Spy? to tell you, if I were to tell you guys, you know, last year, right, going into the game, that Russell's going to get sacked six times. He's not going to have 200 passing yards, and he's only going to complete 52% of his passes with a 75.4 passer rating. You would think, hey, the Eagles probably won that game. Yeah, they did not. So yeah. even when he doesn't wow. play well, they sacked him six times. That was the most in the regular, not the, not the playoff game, the regular season game. game yeah. And they still lost that game 17-9. to nine. I mean, he figures out ways to beat them. Yeah, yeah he's a crafty quarterback. You know, he's like um, some of these athletic quarterbacks that, you know, he, he, he doesn't have a way that he escapes the pro pocket. Mm -hmm. You know, he can, he can escape from anywhere. You know, if he sees a scene, he'll take it. Uh, for me, if I were the defensive coordinator, I would layer my rushes. And what I mean by layering, I would have a defensive end that's going to run high, then my other defensive end that's going to be coming low. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to have a defensive tackle that might run high, and then the other defensive mm -hmm. tackle that runs low. So you can kind of funnel, funnel him in. If not, you know, you're going to have some problems. He's not like Tony Romo that anytime he saw pressure, he would circle out of the left of the yeah. pocket. Russell Wilson would take whatever he can get, and, you know, and he doesn't have a problem with saying, all right, you know what, you got me right here. This is a sack. 
I'm going to fall down, take this sack. But he's going to pressure your linebackers as well because they do a good job of scheming their guys open and putting your guys in, in the situations where your linebackers have to cover some of those underneath routes. I'm sorry, they do a good job of what now? Oh, yeah, they're going to scheme. S scheming guys open? Oh, yeah, they're going to scheme uh, I'm, guys open. I'm not familiar open. with that We've been concept. talking about that all season. <laughs> oh, yeah. Scheming guys open. They also have talent on that side of the ball, too. Absolutely. And they are coached very well. Like, mm -hmm. they don't traditionally beat themselves. You know, Seattle, for the most part, they're in every game. Even if, you know, Russell is struggling here and there. He, he's been struggling as of late throwing picks. But um, for the most part, man, he's, uh, he, he's just that guy that he makes the right play every time, no matter mm -hmm. what it is, if it's a pass or run or escaping. And I always like to look at him like he's a quarterback that can run. He's not a running quarterback, you mm -hmm. know, because they like to go deep. Sure. And, he's a great you know, deep ball thrower. Yeah, yeah. And when, when the opportunity presents itself, they're throwing it up, so. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because he can hurt you in both ways. And one thing that I think Eagles fans in particular should be concerned with tonight is his ability to hurt them on design runs, like the, yeah, zone, read. the zone read. We've seen yeah. it happen this year with Lamar. We've seen it happen with Daniel Jones twice. twice. And clearly, Russell Wilson is fully equipped to do the same thing. And I'm sure Seattle does its homework and its tape study. In fact, we went into the film room to take a look at how the Eagles have performed against the zone read and also how Russell Wilson has used it to his advantage so far this year. So let's take a look with this of this uh, video of Russell Wilson, thanks to our friends from Leverage Studios. The Eagles have struggled this season defending the zone read, and tonight they'll face a zone read master in Russell Wilson. Let's take a look at the breakdowns that have allowed quarterbacks to strike big gains against Jim Schwartz's crew. In week six, the Eagles allowed Lamar Jackson to run 37 yards for a touchdown on zone read with a well-designed concept using motion and misdirection. First, the tight end motions from left to right. At the snap, the left tackle and center pull to the right while Jackson fakes a handoff on a run designed to the left. The fake handoff causes two defenders to bite hard on the outside run while the pulling lineman sucker Nate Gary into losing his gap integrity. All Jackson needs is a lead block from Ronnie Stanley on Brandon Graham to scamper untouched 37 yards to pay dirt. The Giants were paying close attention. The very next week, they hit the Eagles with their own version of the zone read. The Giants also used some pre-snap motion, flexing their tight end in line on the right side. The play starts off looking like an inside zone until you realize Daniel Jones still has the ball after the mesh point and nothing but green grass ahead. Jones has every member of the Giants' defense beaten and outran everyone except that turf monster, which trips him up at the 20 as he picks up 80 yards. From this angle, it's clear as day. Seven in the box, eight if you count Will Parks coming in. Brandon Graham and Rodney McLeod bite hardest toward the inside and leave a clear lane for Jones. Three weeks later, the Giants went for a double dip. On this zone read, the Giants again flex the tight end inside and the play begins looking like another inside zone. Josh Sweat, familiar culprit from the Jackson touchdown, bites on the run action again, giving Jones an alley. A stiff crackback block by Austin Mack on TJ Edwards and a lead block from Caden Smith on Jalen Mills clear the path for Jones as he skirts through the lane and outraces the Eagles D once again. This time, no trip up and he scampers in for the score. Tonight, the Eagles have to worry about Russell Wilson, one of the league's most dangerous running quarterbacks. Wilson already has two big gains off the zone read. The first came against Atlanta on a crafty design that uses orbit motion and misdirection from two pulling linemen. The edge defender crashes hard toward the run while the corner plays the pitch, enabling Wilson to turn the corner and head upfield for a 28-yard gain. In week seven, Wilson hit another big gain against the Cardinals thanks to the read option. Reverse orbit motion and pulling linemen again create an opportunity for Wilson to catch a defense off guard. Jordan Hicks, remember him, is essentially playing one-on-two defense, and he doesn't win. Wilson explodes into the second level and gets sprung by a downfield block from his right guard to pick up more yards. From this view, you can see the defensive tackle actually key on Wilson, but he's not fast enough to catch him in the backfield. Tyler Lockett's orbit motion takes Hicks too far outside, and Chris Banjo's decision to go after Damian Lewis's knees lets Wilson get past the traffic for a 34-yard pickup. You can bet the Seahawks will be looking to get their zone read going 
against an Eagles defense that's had trouble stopping it. Again, a big thanks to our friends at Leverage Studios for the great Coach Paint telestration that they gave to us. So we just saw it. We saw numerous times the Eagles, but not once, not twice, three times the Eagles beat on zone read. And then we saw two examples of Russell Wilson being able to beat two teams himself on. It's a bad mm. combination simply because, guys, the Eagles have done a very b bad job of it this year. But if you go back last year, they gave up one to Josh, uh, Josh Allen from Buffalo. This has seemingly been a bad spot for Jim Schwartz where he cannot get his team to be able to stop that kind of play. Is there, I mean, isn't that something that's got to be repped, especially when you go up against Russell Wilson time and time again in practice? To me, it seems like it's something that you have to have your defensive ends um, discipline. You know, when it comes to defensive play, it's all about gap security and making sure that, you know, everybody does their job, ha handles their gap and whatever it is. So that means that if you see a defensive end that's going crashing down, then that means that he doesn't trust that that linebacker is going to fill the gap. So to mm -hmm. me, it's more about making sure that your guys are going to be gap secure in their play and just be disciplined. You got to tell your defensive end that if there's a big, a heavy zone read offense, your defensive ends need to jet up field instead of taking the cheese for that, that running back fake handoff. I mean, you would have to think Seattle looked at the tape and said, they don't do it that much. They used to do it a lot more mm. with Russell Wilson. They've only done it twice this year, but you kind of got to think that they look at the tape and, and see an opportunity. I mean, I'm sure we'll see it in the red zone because mm -hmm. that's where they did it to him last time they came here. That was a long time ago. You're yeah, right. I, I think remember it was, that. A, like, it was close, like 25 yarder, but yeah, it was yeah. close. Right. So, you know, if, if, I mean, if they've been giving up, you know, those type of easy gimmies, you know, throughout the season. Yeah, of course we'll see tonight. I mean, Seattle doesn't, they doesn't run it well. I mean, most of their backs have been banged up all year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, consistency running the ball, I mean. And then this Eagles defense there, they're good at stopping, like, the traditional runs. It's just when they get exactly. into that read option, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's like people, they, they lose the, the integrity of contain all their gaps. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's something that they would, they, they're going to have to harp on. Adam, let's talk about Jim Schwartz a little bit because mm -hmm. he's kind of flown under the radar this week yeah. in general. I mean, it's been all about Carson. It's been all about Doug, the offense, Jalen Hurts. He's under the radar, man. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, look, I mean, Cleveland got him on a few chunk plays. It's not like Cleveland had a great two, offensive output. 40 plus but, yards, right. Yeah, but all, all season them, long. They, yep. they have not had yet that performance where you – even last year against Seattle, they gave two pretty good defensive efforts and lost. I think we're, Same exact everybody's score. looking for that. Yeah, 17-9. I yeah. don't know. And now yeah, they have a number one corner in Slay, which I would think, barring a major surprise, he will be on DK Metcalf. He has to. Mm -hmm. the Slay is what you would call a bigger and an average corner. He can run. Not that anyone could stop Metcalf. But then there's Tyler Lockett. And then how do you match up against him? Do you use Maddox, who really was drafted to be their slot corner? Right. And Lockett lines up primarily inside, and he is the best vertical slot in the National Football League right now. You saw that game he had against the Cardinals for over 200 yards. It's going to be hard, but the Eagles do have enough corners out there now mm -hmm. to at least match up. Now, how well they match up is a different thing. I'm going to be interested to see what Brian Schottenheimer, the, the OC for the Seahawks, does here because he came out this season, and they became a passing offense, even before their defense collapsed. The last couple of weeks, they're running the ball a lot more. And now they get Chris Carson back. Mm -hmm. If they're trying to be more balanced, that plays into the Eagles' hands. It absolutely does. You brought up DK Metcalf. So I'm going to get this over with now because it seems like obligatory in the city. The Eagles did take last year in the second round J.J. Ortega Whiteside ahead of DK Metcalf, who then fell down to Seattle. And we know the results have been. DK Metcalf looks like he's on his way to a, at least a multi-Pro Bowl career. Not so much for J.J. Ortega Whiteside, who I don't know will be on the team next year. We'll have to see how things shake out. I felt like I have to get that out of the way. It's got to be obligatory mentioned, and now we can kind of move on. I know that kind of thing, you know, you guys as players don't care about that as much, mm -hmm. but it's like a constant thing. I kind of do care you about do? it. Matt Collins, they got rid of him. Like, mm -hmm. J.J., they're going to get rid of him. Like, Nelson, they got rid of him. Like, come on, man. Draft the receiver that's going to stick. Yeah, like, that didn't happen in your era. Oh, you and maybe at the, at the start, there were a couple of wide receivers in the early in the Andy Reid era who didn't fulfill, you know, Freddie. Yeah, but they weren't high. Well, okay. Freddie was the first. Freddie was, was the first one. Filet mignon. Filet mignon? Freddie wasn't bad, man. Freddie it's just, was, you know. Well, let's, I'll give this. Freddie played four years. He was in the Super Bowl. He almost got, you know, as we almost know, he almost yeah. got booted out. 
but JJ may not be in the uh, right. on the Eagles next year. Yeah. 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 It's just far too many receivers that they've chosen in the second through fourth rounds that haven't been panning out. Right. Like even the first round, Nelson's gone already. Sure. And, and doing well. He's doing well in Vegas, Oakland. Yes. Like so, well, Vegas. Yeah. And Matt Collins did have a touchdown this year he for did. the Dolphins. Yes. For the Dolphins. Yeah. yeah how about see, that? You know, it, it can be one of two things: it's the player, the environment, or coaching. Mm -hmm. like, I think it's more of environment sometimes. How so? I think this market isn't for everybody. Yeah, you, you know, got to be tough to play here. Yeah, you can't, you can't have thin skin mm -hmm. and come here and just think that. You can't be a player that's always had everything always good said about you. Mm -hmm. This is not the market for that type of player, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and you have to have a some, certain type of grit about you, a certain type of confidence about you because, you know, this, this, this city is tough, man, to play for. I mean, you know, this, this – Every, and, and you'll see guys, and you, you'll see it when they, they leave and then they flourish because they're like, oh, wow, all right. That, the that's spotlight what I found out what a Philly guy me. was when right. they say you're not a Philly guy. Yeah, right? yeah you're just saying, this isn't for everybody, <laughs> man. You know, mm -hmm. and this city, man, they, especially now with social media, they oh. get right in your face. In your face. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that sometimes with guys that where everything was always, you, you were always the best guy, everything was always peachy for you. You never was challenged. Yeah, yeah. you're not going to make it here. Do you, it's funny because I talk about the Steelers and the Ravens a lot, and they are teams that have, uh, when they do talk about their draft philosophy, they, they kind of make it known that they have a model player in mind. And it almost doesn't matter what position, but there's a certain set of criteria that they really prefer in that player when they're drafting. And I know with the Steelers, they talk about you got to be able to play against a smash mouth team like the Ravens in a cold weather, mm -hmm. December, maybe even January type game, right? And they seem to have that, that model of what they're looking for. And I wonder, I've always wondered, do the Eagles have that or does their model change a little bit? Matt Collins, you brought it up. Great special teamer. Not exactly a burner, right? Same mm -hmm. thing with um, uh, Ortega Whiteside. Not really a burner. Then they just spent this whole draft drafting wide Getting receivers burners, right? who are nothing but burners, right? And so you wonder about their, their consistency and their model and what they're looking for. Well, well they're mean, looking for players that got that dog in them. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't care about that's what, what they you should be did. looking for. Yeah, that's right. what you should be looking for. You should be looking for the player that's been challenged, that has a little grit in them, that's been challenged, that, that when you turn on the film, it doesn't matter who he's playing against. He's coming out there and he's smacking whoever's in front of him, no matter if it's from somebody that's lesser competition to somebody that might be greater. He's coming in there slapping anybody in the mouth. Mm -hmm. But you can't always look for the best athlete because that best athlete might not have the qualities that you're looking for. It's a copycat league. They was mm -hmm. looking for, you know, the Kansas City Chiefs wide receivers, all these speedsters. Right. You know, because that's what their, their, that's what their uh, wide receiver room looks like, just track guys. Well, last year here, Jeff, how many times did we say the Eagles have the slowest group of receivers? Gre our Greg Cosell would say that, okay? Yeah. When he would watch the Eagles offense. So they, they have a bunch of fast guys. John Hightower flashed a little bit earlier this season. He's really not in the rotation right now. Rager's a starter. But where are the big plays? Is, is it just Wentz? Or are they not scheming these guys open? I, I contend they're not scheming them open. Enough. Hmm. And that's the thing, is it? We, we talk about this a lot. Uh, Doug's asking these guys to win in man coverage. But that, as you guys say, sometimes you're facing defenses that are not allowing you to get beat over the top. So it's not just as simple as run this route and beat that man over the top when you have a safety 20 yards deep, right? What can Doug do more to be able to help these guys when they are facing tighter coverage? Is I it mean, rub routes? Is it quicker stuff? Motion? Yeah, in breaking? Well, yeah. I mean, if you look at um, the Rams offense, yes. Yes. Oh, they God. try to make everything look the same. They got the motion and they got the, the, the wide receivers that do these little dig routes and rub routes. Like, he mm -hmm. schemes it in a, in a way that he uses their strength, like, on the field. Like, he doesn't tell uh, Cooper Cuff to run a go route every, every play because he's not that bad. Right, right. He schemes right. him open. Right. right. So, and that's, right. What, that's what they need to do here. Doug mm -hmm. hasn't been doing that. For the most part, have, that all have, for, from what we've been seeing, sure. you know, we haven't seen any plays where we're like, oh, man, that's a, that's a neat play. You see right. how they got him open mm -hmm. on that? Like, everything has just been vanilla. Like, they're still in preseason. Sure. Mm -hmm. so, so Metcalf is the guy that the Eagles probably have in mind when they go out and make the Darius Slade trade. They were beat over the top constantly last year. In fact, it was Metcalf who pretty much ended their season when he caught that pass over Marcus Epps, I want to say. Uh, on third and long that enabled oh, Seattle to then run out the clock yeah. in the playoff game after that. Adam mentioned this. The bigger matchup that I'm kind of concerned with 
is Tyler Lockett, who is more of a technician against Avante Maddox, who probably should be a slot corner. And honestly, by the way he's played this year, you wonder if he's actually going to be able to even be a, a really good functional slot corner. Even against Cleveland, against wide receivers who are not very fast, he was not able to keep up. Is that, to me, that's, that's the matchup that you have to be concerned about tonight. I mean, I'm concerned about Lockett anytime he's healthy. Because uh -huh. he's, really like, good football he's like the best. He should be a number one, but he's like the best number two in the league. Yeah. <laughs> he actually, there are some stats that say he's uh, done better than DK. I believe he's their team leader in reception. So he's more targeted and catches more passes than DK. It's just that DK makes the splashier plays. Yeah. And then, he's, he's and then the tackles, expression. too. You know, DK's yeah. a good tackler if you hadn't but yeah, seen. But, I'm, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm scared of uh, Lockett, man, because he's such a home run hitter, and he runs that great routes. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, I, and by him being small, you know, he can run inside, he can run outside, and he definitely can take your top off the cover. So, yeah. so who do you put Slay on? Because that's going to be a problem. I, right? I, I bracket him. Well, you know, no. Because he's a big guy. Yeah, yeah, you can yeah. use two yeah, guys yeah. to cover him while not physically covering him. Right. And you just stick uh, either your fastest corner or Slay on a locket because I think he, he, he'll he hurt you more. Than DK, even though DK better, is a you can move guy. Lockett. That's right. the, that's yeah. why, right? So yeah. you're saying for those that you put Slay over Lockett, and then when you say bracket, you have your corner of Ante Maddox and a safety and a slid safety. over yeah. there. Plus, you may have a linebacker take a drop on right. certain like, ones. Like you don't cover him, man. Kind of like zone him off a little bit. Sure. You know? mm -hmm. So, but you you want to give attention to him. But Lockett, hey man, you follow him everywhere he go, because. You know, it could be a five-yard slant to a 60-yard bomb. That, that, that's interesting because Jim has used Slay as a trail corner this year, mm -hmm. and it's the first time that Eagles fans have actually seen him do that. But he's also kind of a set-in-his-way type of guy. So I don't – while you make a lot of sense, I wonder if Jim says, nope, we brought Slay in here for mm -hmm. guys like Metcalf. We stick to bringing – you know, to, to traveling on Metcalf. I wonder if he still believes that Avante Maddox can hold his own I mean, against either Tyler that Lockett. or he has – uh, an enormous amount of faith in those guys up front to get to um, Russell because, right. you know, when he wants to, Fletcher can dominate a game. Absolutely. You know, when he's having that, when he's, when, when he's up against, I guess, when he's given the opportunity, BG can have a two, three sack game. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they have some guys that can get out to the quarterback. Are they going to be disciplined enough to not break any pain? You right. Know? So. Well, that's what we have to find out. By the way, I was telling about the numbers before. Metcalf fourth in the league with nine touchdown catches. That's right behind Thielen, Tyreek Hill, although that's that's before last night. So Tyreek has put some distance in there. And of course, Devontae Adams, who also played uh, last night and, and caught, a, I think, a touchdown in that game. Metcalf was also seventh in receiving yards and top five in catches of 20 and 40 yards. So he is certainly the real deal. But as I mentioned, Lockett, 69 catches, 748 yards, and only one fewer touchdown than Metcalf. He has eight himself. So you're looking at May, probably the best wide receiver tandem, uh, certainly the most productive one in the league. You make a good point about the Chiefs. They've got Tyreek Hill. You want to throw Kelsey in there and call it yeah, like a tandem. A <laughs> that, that's pretty good. He's pretty much a wide receiver. I'm trying to think if there's anybody else that really kind of comes into uh, play. Nicole when you talk Hartman, about Hartman, they have Watkins. They got, they, right. they got uh, receivers that can start on other teams. DeMarcus yeah. Robinson and, and – they, they, they who's the, who's the guy that catches a couple passes a game? I, 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 what's his name? Uh, the, he's like their fifth string wide Pringle. Like, Byron, oh, Byron Pringle. Pringle. Yeah. On they got a guy passed. named Byron right. Pringle right. comes right. in there right. catches. They all run like four threes. threes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, nobody does key. it better. Um, talking again about Eagles wide receivers, I have to ask you guys this. It's been on my mind for quite a while, and I'm not trying to disrespect the guy. I feel like we have the same conversation about Jason Peters. We have respect for what he's done, but the team seems to be moving in a different direction. I don't understand why Alshon Jeffrey is playing right now when you've got Fulgham, Rager, you got to work them into the offense. You saw what you saw out of Travis Fulgham, look like the real deal. He's now only had one catch, I believe, in each of his last two games. There was a third and eight last week against Cleveland where they were in 11 personnel with Jeffrey, Fulgham, and Ward. Third and eight, and Jalen Rager is nowhere to be found. He's their fastest wide receiver. Does this make sense to you guys, this, this force feeding of Alshon Jeffrey? Yeah, absolutely. He's the money man. Oh, come on. I mean, he's the money man. And that's where everybody needs to just, like, get off of that, you know, oh, he's better. He's doing more of this. And he, look, it's all about who's getting the money. And that's why you see JP get, keep getting forced back into this lineup, even though Jordan Maialata might be the better selection. 
JP is the money man. You're right. not going to sit up there and right. spend all this money and, and have them sit on the bench. That's why you see Alshon getting forced into it. Like, once he can play, you're going to put him out there. He's the money man. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't but necessarily call him forced. No, I, I feel like Trey is not endorsing he, it. I feel like he's explaining the reality no, of the no, situation. No, I'm, I'm just saying okay. just for the sake of, you know, the amount of targets he's had since he's came back. It, it has to be like under seven. Per game, definitely. No, oh, total. Yeah, total. Total. yeah, total. Right, so they're not forcing anything. They're just trying to find but who every can time, produce for them. Right, every you time know? you put him on the field, even if it's seven times, you know what, it's no. either. No, 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 I'm not going to really hurt my feelings. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I'm not, done. but all, I didn't say all, anything all to come to you. Man, you're you're just not welcome back on the show anymore. <laughs> also, my man Travis, like, I, I know his production has slipped, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't, like, attest that to anything Alshon has done. He's been dropping balls. Like, he, he hasn't been sure-handed as he was, you know, six talking weeks about, ago. Talking about Travis. Yeah. Right, he like, he, I mean, I'm, I, I, know inactives. Every, I know everything is close. All right. All right. Real quick, we'll go with the inactives. inactives. Yeah, we just got the Eagles, and they are Sudfeld, of course, Huntley, Rudy Ford is out, Lane Johnson, and Quez Watkins. There you go. All right, so, so pretty much everybody. So, Gerard Avery is active tonight. Gerard Avery is active. Wow, so, they're going to okay. act. They have five defensive end act, uh, active, correct? Uh, you yeah, got, wow, that's interesting. You, know, you got Josh Sweat, yeah. Brandon Graham. Vinny Kirk, Curry, Kirk's Derek back. Barnett, right. and Jannard Avery. Oh. Is that because, really, if you're going to attack Seattle, you're going to attack them on the edges. They've got the two, uh, the, the, the backup, backup right, right tackle, tackle in, right? and then their right. left tackle is not. Dwayne Brown, who, yeah, he's, he's a little just talking to, Yeah, exactly. He's not, exa he's not the same as he used to be. Mm -hmm. A post such as a below average center. The Eagles D-line should dominate, but it's Russell Wilson. you got to get to it. That's the thing. And the, it's, as you guys were talking about, the linebackers have to be disciplined, mm -hmm. which has been a problem against running quarterbacks. To, to, to go back to the point on Alshon, your special teams is an important part of the game. He is your fourth or fifth wide receiver. Yeah, he does yeah, not yeah. play special teams. You don't have Rudy Ford. You don't have Craig James So because of injury. So you're already down on special teams guys. So that's why I wonder, what, what, what is the point of having him on the active roster, playing him even three and a half, four snaps a game just to put him out there? Is he produ producing? Do you expect production out of him at this point? Wouldn't you rather see the younger guys get their, get their run in? Well, at this point, um, I mean, he's been out for so long, you know, and it, like, it hasn't seemed as though him and Wentz have been on the same page mm -hmm. for a while now, you know? So, I mean, I would like to see what I have in the younger guys, you know, because we know that this is going to be his last year here. I think I don't, I don't think Alshon clearly the back. Oh yeah, I, him and Deshaun. Oh, there's yeah. no way. To so yeah. you know, why not see what you got in the young guys? I understand the, the financial ramifications, but as Doug said a couple of weeks ago, you know, if we go with Hurts, that means we're giving up on the season. Mm -hmm. It looks like we're going to Hurts. Well, then why, so. why do we see all these reports about Hurts getting more reps? Like, I, whether they're true or not, I think they are true. In fact, I, I feel strongly they're true. And then why did Doug say what he said last Wednesday as we started the show today? Why would you come out and say this in this media market of all places where everything's going to be scrutinized in talk radio especially Picks up and on our show everything. and on your show? Why do that? Why go there unless there's some truth to it? Yeah, yeah I, I don't know. And, and, you know, with this organization, you just never know what the word is because, I mean, you'll come out and say, all right, hey, we're going to go this way, but then you're going in a totally different direction. So. You never know what's being said, what's the truth, what's false, what direction they're really going in. I don't know if it's a ruse. Is it the Kansas City shuffle? Who knows? I don't, I, I don't know. Are we looking left and going right? Are we saying, hey, we're going to, you know, because you come out and you say, all right, you know what? We're going to do more rollouts for Carson Wentz. How many rollouts did they call for Carson Wentz? None. None. And Maybe Doug one. And said I could have done it more, although he did say some of them were killed. By the run pass, uh, yeah, you know, built but, into but the you only hey, call man, one. Going back, killed the play. But you, but there's only one. You know <laughs> what I'm saying? And that leads me because a, a, a report was was put out there to say like, all right, where Carson is killing a lot of the plays. As a, a OC, as a head coach, and you're saying, all right, Carson is c killing all the plays. Wouldn't you want to check that? Yeah. I think that if you're calling the play and you're saying, hey man, listen, you're killing all my plays. This could have worked. You're checking in the plays that aren't working. Why hasn't that been checked? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it's just, man, the precedent well, I mean, has been set Maybe a it's long being time checked ago. right now with and, the idea that Jalen Hurts could be uh, uh, in I'm not worried about that's the why I think thing. Doug, he doesn't, he doesn't have 
a clear explanation when he's asked certain things about said quarterback or the offense. You know, uh -huh. he's like, he don't want to say in so many words, man, I'm calling the offense. If he's not executing it, they're not executing it, then what do you want me to do? <laughs> I get you that. Know? And, and most of the time that he's up there answering questions, that sounds like a coach that doesn't have a hold or he doesn't have all the answers to like the organiz or organizational problems. Like, right. it's when's it going to start? Oh, today he's my starter. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, I'll say he, I'll say yeah. Like it was confused in his answer. You, so yeah, you also made an interesting observation off the air on, on Jalen Hurts and Russell Wilson, which yeah. was, well, I think I look at them kind of like the same mm -hmm. player, so to speak. You know, whereas they both uh, changed uh, college institute, so to speak. They both True. Um, are, you know, they're not running quarterbacks. They can run. Mm -hmm. Like we just want to label Jalen Hurts an option quarterback where he left Alabama. It was a more running oriented style. Sure. And then he went to Oklahoma and was a front runner for the Heisman. Like, oh, uh, Heisman mm -hmm. runner up. And, and you get that for throwing the ball. Right. So I don't get the notion that he's just this running quarterback and he can't succeed in the league. I'm mm -hmm. just like, let's see what he got. Yeah, I, I gotta say, in, in, in the pre-draft scouting that, that when we talked to sources, I didn't hear that he was over reliant per se on the run. It was just the offensive framework that he was in and his tendencies as a quarterback. Adam, I believe you, you did a lot of work on Russell, uh, on, uh, on Jalen Hurts. Yes. What was the dominant thing you would hear from people around the league? In terms of? About you know, where they kind of had him in the draft and why. Third or fourth round. Mm -hmm. um, developmental quarterback, you like the kid, high character, good strong body, just need to ever find the mechanics. He was a down the line guy. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing was, and now the Eagles could frame it any way they want, but and you could say he obviously beat out Nate Sudfeld. Now, Nate Sudfeld, what has happened to him the last three years? They're paying him $2 million that he doesn't even dress. Right. And one thing I like about the kid, because I follow him in, Ertz? Um, yeah, yeah, about yeah. Ertz, he's a natural leader. Like, he left Alabama, you know, mm -hmm. with. And he handled and, that really and he well. With well right. over. He Absolutely. didn't make a big fuss about it. Nope. He went to Oklahoma and became a captain. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, so he has leadership qualities. And. You know, a quarterback like that, anybody w wants to play for. Like, you can see it. You don't have to talk to him. Right. Well, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, he has an arm, though. I, at training camp, yeah. I was there for a couple of days. I was like, he, he's got pop in his arm. So if he does play tonight, for whatever reason that might may be, mm -hmm. and the weather conditions have cleared up, I would like to see him throw the football. I, you know, yeah. I've been saying for weeks, you play him a series at least, just let him get comfortable with these cameos. Yeah, it, it, it's it. like you can't get a read on. Right. Like, why did you draft this guy in the second round if you're gonna let him throw the ball once every month? Right. You know? Right. Yeah, it's been a very odd usage of Jalen Hurts, but tonight it's either gonna be more odd or we're gonna we'll we're, see gonna, we're happens, gonna find yeah. out some things. Yeah. Uh, or Carson Wentz is I mean, gonna play lights yeah, out. I mean, hopefully, yeah, my man yeah. escape man of the game if he comes through in the first half. So you know, <laughs> he, he, you know, no, yeah, Carson's just gonna put it all. Yeah, on put rest. all the rest, man. Put all the rest. <laughs> Rip open the shirt, <laughs> Superman. Uh, the AL one, man. Hey, All yeah, right. You gotta... Well, it's time to do what we do uh, the worst here, and that's make our predictions, of course, courtesy of DraftKings. <laughs> we don't have winning records on this, not, not one of us. Because we're playing homers every week. Well, no, sort no. of. But, sort of. No, 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 trade, not always, but his well, wait, record still isn't that great no. either. Hey. We'll get into that in a second. <laughs> uh, I mentioned DraftKings. The gyms may not be full, but there's definitely no shortage of, shortage of madness this college basketball season. And for us fans, the college basketball powers that be have gifted us with a top-tier matchup between two powerhouses. This weekend, Gonzaga and Baylor will be going toe-to-toe -to -toe for what could be the nation's top ranking. DraftKings Sportsbook, America's top-rated sportsbook app, is bringing you closer to the action with these can't-miss offers. DraftKings Sportsbook is giving all college basketball fans who sign up now the chance to win $100 when betting on either Gonzaga or Baylor to win this clash of titans. Plus, you'll get a deposit bonus up to $1,000 when signing up using promo code ITB. DraftKings Sportsbook has endless ways for you to bet, from live betting to betting on your favorite players. They do it all. DraftKings is safe, reliable, and secure, making it easy for you to deposit and withdraw your money at your convenience. So download the top-rated DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use the promo code ITB when you sign up for your shot to turn $1 into $100 when betting on either Gonzaga or Baylor to win. That's right, bet $1 to win $100. Use that promo code ITB during sign up. Take advantage of these great offers for a limited time 
only at DraftKings Sportsbook. you got to be 21 or older, Pennsylvania only, in partnership with Meadows Racetrack and Casino. Bonus comprised of a first deposit bonus. Deposit bonus requires 25 times playthrough. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. As it tends to do, the line on this game has been very jumpy mm. all week. Uh, as we sit here now on the DraftKings Sportsbook uh, app, the Seahawks are now six-point favorites over the Eagles tonight. So the Eagles are six-point wow. home underdogs. And the what did it open at? Over under, I thought it was five and a half. Okay. Then I mm. thought it got down to four at one point, and now it is six. You know, all that late money yeah. comes mm. in and moves the line. So almost a touchdown favorite Seattle is here. Now, wait a minute. What did we say the score was last year? It's 17 to nine, right? Both times. Both times. They're exactly the same yeah, score. So uh, yeah. eight yeah. point victory for Seattle twice here. I, we've got to look up and see if that's ever happened, where a team goes into another team's house twice in a year, a regular season a playoff game and wins by the exact same score. They weren't impressive at all. Like the games? No, they were like, really ugly. Really really we should have, he should have points tonight, right? <laughs> yeah. Come on. Well, DraftKings uh, set the over-under at 48 and a half, right. which, you know, for an NFL game today is not that much. <laughs> Rainy? Yeah, a lot more than 17-9. Passing mm, weather? <laughs> would give you. All right, Jamal, you're going to start off. You are uh, picking in place of Greg Cosell, who's normally yep. doing our I pick. By the way, Greg is five and five. He and Trey are tied with the best records at five and five. Me and Adam are four and six. Okay. What do you got? I mean, my guy has to come through tonight. Uh, his defense is awful. Well, pass defense is awful. So mm -hmm. I got the birds tonight. They they got to win this one if they're gonna make any any type of run. 27-20. Now, you just blamed the other panelists for being homers for their yeah, bad and you, and you picked the Eagles to win. Well, I don't work here all the time. All right. Well, maybe it's <laughs> if, you know, you're just trying to fit in here. Yeah. That, we accept that. So, Jamal <laughs> says Eagles 27, Seattle 20. Trey, who do you got? I told y'all last time I, I, I officially am done lying to the people. Uh -huh. And saying that, hey, you know what, they're going to win, and then I go and put my money on the other team. <laughs> so um, I'm done lying to you guys. Um, Seattle wins. I don't even know, whatever it is. Can, Got can, Seahawks uh, win. Let me ask you this because I, I know you yeah, don't Yeah, they're going to cover the spread. High scoring, low scoring? Like, I don't know. I don't care. Okay. I, I think they're going to cover the spread oh, by, okay, cover. by what? They're going to win by a touchdown. You know, would, like, yeah, right. yeah I, I don't see this team, you know, we haven't scored out of the teams yet. Well, how many? I think we've gotten out of the teams what twice? Only, only against the really good teams. Yeah, only against uh, the Pittsburgh really good teams. Pittsburgh and Baltimore. And Seattle's yeah. a good team. So yeah, yeah. So yeah, chance. no, I don't see this happening. Uh, all right, no, I don't see it happening. So you say that they by a touch, so they kick the PAT to win by seven? No, I, I think that Seattle wins by whatever the spread is six. Six. Okay. So yeah, they'll win by seven. Yes, they'll okay, win, win by, by seven. seven. Yes. Got it. I just want to, you know, yeah. get, get it clear. Yeah. So they're gonna cover. Okay. Yeah, they'll cover. I think Seattle will cover. <laughs> is that forty-eight? Right. Yeah, 48 and a half. Wow. Yeah, that half mean, always gets you, man. Yeah. I know. You take the Every over, time. it's 48. Every time. Take Every the time. under, it's 47 and a half. Or but no, it's 47. Again, we go on the last two, 17 and 9, 17 and 9. I don't think we're going to have uh, too much high score. There you go. All right, I've got it. Eagles 20, the Seahawks 27. Oh, yeah, all right. Okay. Man, hey, I'm Seahawks. telling you. Is that, is that a positive that the Eagles get to 20 in your mind? Like, Do you feel like they scored two I touchdowns? Mean, how do they not score at least not, 20 right? tonight? <laughs> if very, Parsi very had been playing well, no, I know. But if Parsi <laughs> had been playing well, they're scoring 30 tonight. But because they are not, and the quarterback's not. Yeah. This team averages giving up 358 yards through the air a game. I know, I know. That's, That's a, a lot, lot of yards. yards. That's like, a lot of yards. So. And, it's not like it's a great call. I mean, two quarterbacks, quarterbacks that's going to get their receivers. That's the two well, quarterbacks that their office coordinator are scheming the guys open. All right. I'll, I'm going to finish this thing off. And, um, Can't argue that. I'm pulling a surprise. I'm actually picking the Eagles to win tonight. I did it wow. a couple of days ago in our podcast, and then all, everything went to hell Steve after that. Wade, Lane Johnson Wade. got hurt. But you know what? <laughs> I, sometimes the Eagle, sometimes in the NFL, you can go and break down an entire game and make an argument for why one team is supposed to win, the other team is supposed to lose, mm -hmm. and for whatever reason, the opposite happens. So I don't really have great logic. I don't think the Eagles are the better team. I don't think they're as bad as they've been mm -hmm. all year long. I feel like at some point, the law of averages says they got to snap out. I may not pick them to win the rest of the year, but I am picking them to win tonight against Seattle, 28 to 23 will be the final score. To gain their oh, first. Oh, over. What? You're always going over. To gain oh, their first place. 
to become first place. Become, become first place again in the NFC East again. Okay. Mm. Yeah, no. Only I, to see what happens next Sunday I'm, when they play Green Bay. I'm, I'm, I'm with you, Jeff, man. This is right. like, they call it the fall for a reason. I'm hit the ground sometimes. Well, right. <laughs> next they week hit the ground. Yeah, they haven't hit the ground. They gotta hit it sometimes. It's getting there. If the Eagles get killed, I wear the clown mask next week when we do the show for previewing the. The Sunday game against Green Bay, which will start at 125, I believe, next Sunday because it is a 425 yeah, game. Oh, one, I'm sorry, 1 o'clock. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll start, start one at yeah. 1 o'clock. Same bat time, bat channel right here on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter of at uh, Inside the Birds. Want to give big thanks to DraftKings, Manscaped, Goose Island Brew House, Rebel Hill Productions, uh, our friends at Leverage Studio, our special guest, Jamal Jackson. Me. Sky Motors. Did a great job. Man. Sky Motor bad, Cars man. and Brett Shoulder. He hurt my feelings, man. I just want to make sure I let this. He hurt my feelings. Got to get over Jamal, that, man. You know, passing Apparently. strength is to the Got to get over that, man. Passing strength Two is jet. to the we side learned it. of the receivers. We, we appreciate Fly protection. your final man, appearance right? on this show, right. Jamal. Right. right. And, <laughs> and um, Very three jet would be to the, to the right. To the right. Just came in here and just crushed everything I've been saying. I love the education, man. All right, Over make these sure past you're... couple weeks, I've been sounding really solid. I know. And I know. Jack come in. I, I won't right. invite him back. Oh, I hey, promise. Adam, next time we'll get into man, gal. <laughs> just man. crushed it. Just crushed you know, everything uh, that I've been saying. Lingo, rookies. Uh, uh, make sure you, like, you are subscribed to the Inside the Birds podcast. Listen out for, you know, Tales from the Blind Side with Jamal Trey and Todd Harriman's. And, of course, uh, Trey Thomas and Derek Gunn doing Grilling the Birds, which yes. will come out later this week. Everybody, enjoy the game. We'll talk to you next week.